Islam, tidak masalah. Bring to them people of high moral character 
and spiritual maturity. Among the many voices which cry out to them every day, may they hear your voice above all others. As we look to our counsellors for assurance and guidance, especially at times of crisis, inspire them and speak through them by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Julian. Before we formally commence this evening's business, can I please remind all members of the following? Please remain focused on the topic being discussed. Please don't repeat points which have already been made. Please avoid interrupting other councillors and respect the position of the Lord Mayor. Please indicate, if possible, by show of hand uh, if you wish to speak, and I will then call you as appropriate, maybe assisted by John. Please remember that this meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded onto the YouTube channel so members of the public will see and hear what is being said and decided. I will now formally open the extraordinary meeting of council which relates specifically to the council's budget for the forthcoming year. However, the first item on the agenda is the opportunity to submit an advanced public question and I can confirm that we've received one public question from Tony Cox, who I'm looking for. Oh, oh, thank you, Mr. Cox. Can I ask you to come down and ask your question? Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Tony Cox. My daughter Lorraine Cox was murdered in the high street of our safe city. I believe a CCTV room manned, managed properly, could save lives. You claim safe city, but too often run it neglectfully after acquiring almost half a million to support safer streets. Why is funding not found? to man adequately to keep everyone safe, in turn confirming that lives matter more than money. That's my 50 words, one question. Thank you. The Leader of the Council, Council Bialik, I invite you to respond to Tony's question. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, at this point, uh, Tony, you've had a close relationship working with the Deputy Leader uh, Councillor Laura Wright, and I'm going to ask Laura Wright, Councillor Wright, to respond. Thank you, Lord Mayor, Mr. Cox. The Safer Streets funding was a one off capital grant from the Home Office, not ongoing revenue funding, meaning that it can't be used for staffing and salaries. We've spent the funding on updating and expanding the CCTV equipment and infrastructure to give better coverage, improve images and recording facilities, and to make the system simpler and more efficient for our control of suffering. This will improve the detection of crime and antisocial behaviour, and improve the quality of evidence that we gather to aid the police. We always aim for two people in the control centre, which is achieved for the vast majority of the time. Occasionally, with unexpected sickness, we're not always able to achieve that. In order to guarantee two members of staff, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, accounting for unforeseen sickness and absence, we actually need an additional five members of staff to be employed. This creates an additional funding need of £155,550 per year. As yet, we do not have sufficient revenue funding to employ the additional staff members required to guarantee a minimum of two people in the control room on every shift. 
but we'll continue to look for ways to achieve this, one of which is to continue our talks with the Police and Crime Commissioner for Devon Cornwall. Lord Mayor, I'd like to thank Mr Cox and to acknowledge the work that he and his family are doing to help shape ongoing discussions and partnerships across the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Um, Mr Cox, you have the opportunity to ask a supplementary question based on the response from Laura. Do you have another question? I would like to say something else, yeah. Yep, go ahead. Unfortunately, I didn't get eight days' notice of that answer. Yeah, to think about my answer, so it's going to be on the spot and probably not exactly what I could think as soon as I walk out the door. But you talk about responsibilities, yeah, preventing crime. I hope you've all received the email I sent you. And if anybody didn't, please contact me. I will forward it to you. I did try my best to get it to everybody. But I heard their prevention of crime. What we've all seen was a total failure in that email of your CCTV system. The maintenance of it, prevention. Now, we all know there's a series, a whole series of problems involved in this case. We can only talk about it case by case as we go along. My daughter was vulnerable. He started with the speech at the beginning by the good gentleman at the top, protecting the vulnerable. If anybody had been watching that monitor, you would have seen a vulnerable person, yeah? On a camera that wasn't filled with a tree for nearly two years, yeah? If anybody watching it, they'd have seen her stumble. But being drunk isn't a crime. They would have seen her being let back if your camera at John Lewis had been maintained and working. So when you talk about prevention, this is the worst case of a total failure. And I ask you to seriously, everybody, think what £155,000 could do for the residents and the confidence in this city who have no support, can give their confidence back, yeah, and actually start to lead a Safer City campaign with genuine intent, yeah. Now I ask you to seriously think about this, £155,000. This case has cost millions, tens of millions, yeah? So I ask you to really consider, if it was your daughter, if it was your son, would you accept these answers? I haven't come here today on a whim. I've come here after nine months of trying to find resolutions. We'll go back to that tree. It had been filming before September the 1st, that tree. Yeah? It continued to film that tree until I got involved in May. And it still took me six months to cut the tree down. Yeah, a shambolic. £155,000. Most superstores provide a security guard to stop you stealing a tin of beans. Yeah, this nighttime economy is vital to this city. The university is vital to this city. If you want this to happen again for £155,000, it could ruin the reputation of this city. I ask you all to work together. Party politics aside, I've asked that in the email and think from the bottom of your heart, would you want to be stood here in front of another parent, or if it was your child, how would you feel in my position? Yeah, I'm asking you all to look deep into your hearts, find that money, restore confidence in this city. I think you've all had examples of how it's been shattered. Yeah, you hold the key to unlocking this. Yeah, I will not stop fighting for justice. You are all invited to walk on March the 6th. Yeah, walk this, whatever you want to do. Yeah, and show this city, the university, the residents, that you do care about them. £155,000. That's the first time I've heard that figure. I didn't get eight days. So this is all said a little bit. I hope I'm getting my strength of emotion and feeling across what we've had to do with your city centre. What happened to my daughter? Could have been anybody. We don't know who lives in the city centre, we haven't got a clue. Yeah, and there's lots of this. As Philip, Laura, and Kareem know, there's other topics to do with this. That apparently is nobody's responsibility. Fantastic. Yeah, I ask you all to work together, unite the city, lead, leaders lead. I, I would be surprised if there's one councillor here that hasn't had at least one contact with a member of public worried about safety. 
£155,000, I ask you to work together and solve this. Don't make it political for once, put that to one side and think about the residents of your city. Your relatives, probably. Yeah? It's everybody. This isn't a party political thing. This has got nothing to do with politics. This is doing the right thing. Yeah, and I ask totally, you. You've addressed us all, and I think we have all heard that, and I know there will be further conversations. Okay. Thank you for coming. Councillor Laura Wright, do you want to respond on behalf of the council? Thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll, I'll deal with the supplementary. Tony made reference to the email that he sent to a number of people yesterday. You haven't had a response from me yet, or uh, many others, because uh, it is a detailed uh, reply that you require. So I've asked the officers yesterday that I need a reply. Tony, we've had a number of meetings with you. We've been trying to do what we can. We understand the issues you've raised to us. We will, we're continuing to meet you. You know you can meet us when you want to, and we will do that. Some of the questions you've raised, we will continue to meet and discuss with you. It is a serious matter. It's upset us all, and we all want to do as much as we can. That's what I can promise you going forward. I know, I know full well we will be meeting again and discussing all these matters, Tony. Thank you. Once again, I ask you to work together. Thank you, Tony. Um, you may take your seat, or if you wish to, you may leave. It's your choice now. Thank you for coming. I will return to the agenda. And at agenda number two, on page five, um, yeah, that was just for your reference. Members of the Council's two scrutiny committees, the Strategic Scrutiny Committee and the Customer Focus Scrutiny Committee, were invited to comment on the 2022-23 budget. A combined scrutiny meeting was held on the 10th of February. The minute extracts from that meeting, namely minutes 4, 5, 6 and 7, are included on the agenda for members to note. I would remind you there will be the opportunity to ask any questions of clarification of these minutes at the ordinary meeting of the council later this evening. At agenda number, item number three, starting on page 11, is the minute extract of minute eight, the discussion relating to the 2023-22-23 budget, budget by the executive at its meeting held on 11th of January 2022. The details of which are also set out on your agenda papers for information. You may wish to leave making any comments from the executive minute extract to the ensuing debate of the 2022-23 budget later in this extraordinary meeting of council. Next to agenda item number four. I hope that sounded more coherent to you than it did to me. The next item on the agenda is agenda item number four, starting on page 13, which relates to the 2022-23 budget and the details and recommendations are set out on your agenda papers. I now call on the leader to move the proposed budget for the 2022-23 period. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I would formally move uh, the, uh, the budget at this moment in time and reserve the right to speak. Lord Mayor, we have a number of alternative proposals and as we've discussed, it's only appropriate that we deal with those alternatives in the first instance and I will then speak to the budget once we have dealt with those things. So I formally move that, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Bialik. Do we have a seconder? For the budget when we do get to debate. I second Lord Mayor and I also reserve the right to speak. Thank you, that's really helpful. So I confirm as Councillor Bialik has said that in accordance with Standing Order 10 bracket 7, I've been informed that both the Progressive Group and the Conservative Group have given the necessary notice of their intention to move an alternative budget. Before we enter into debate on the budget, we will take these amendments, as Phil has said. We will debate them and vote on them, one at a time. 
based on the order in which they were received. May I just remind you that the right of reply at the end of the debate, the mover and the seconder of a motion, should address only those points raised during the debate. We will take the first alternative to the budget, which was received from the Progressive Group. And I invite Councillor Kevin Mitchell to propose the first alternative budget. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, would you like me to read out the uh, proposal? Uh, yes, I think that would be really helpful. Um, that, so the proposal, um, the first proposal from the Progressive Group is that the Council employ a full-time planning enforcement officer, Great G, in 2022-23. The total cost of this post, including the market surcharge and on costs, is £41,196. The cost of this additional post uh, be found by the Council introducing a charging regime for its pre-application advice service to developers using a system similar to Plymouth City Council in regards to a major development deemed to be 10 properties or more. The scale of charges is £2,028 to £3,728. There is a higher negotiated scale of charges for developments involving more than 150 properties. Last year, the Council was involved in pre-application advice regarding 26 major developments. Therefore, using the Plymouth scale, um, the income that Exeter could have raised last year would have been a minimum of £52,728. I would like to propose um, that motion. Thank you, Kevin. Do we have a seconder? Thank you, Michael. Do you want to... I'll yeah, thank you. Right, so we'll have the debate and then we will have Michael's reserved right to speak. Kevin will sum up and the leader will be the last person to speak. So before I open up the debate on the first of two amendments from the Progressive Group, can I please remind all members to show respect for their fellow councillors allowing all to feel that they have had the opportunity to contribute to what they feel necessary. And once the debate has concluded, members will be able to vote on the matter. So, I'm going to be looking for hands if anybody wishes to speak to this. Lord Mayor, I think I need to introduce it for now. Oh, sorry, I thought you had. Uh, um, no, no, I just read that motion. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> my apologies. I'll get this right by the end of the year. If you could introduce it, uh, Kevin, that'd be great. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, there are currently a backlog of approximately 160 planning enforcement cases which are open within our city. I regularly get contacted by residents who have concerns about developments and the flout and flouting of the conditions agreed by the planning committee and our planning team. I very much suspect I am not alone in this chamber and I am sure all of you are also being contacted. The public need to have confidence in the planning system, and the key element of that confidence is in knowing the City Council will quickly investigate and enforce any planning breaches if needed. This amendment will therefore assist with that aim and alleviate any concerns residents may currently have. We have long called for a planning enforcement officer, and to be fair, the administration have recently recognised the need and has therefore employed a temporary agency officer for a six-month period. The current six-month position will cost the City Council £43,000 and is funded from the Planning Fee Uplift Fund. Our proposal for a permanent post will cost the City Council £41,196 per annum and will be funded by charging developers for major pre-application advice, like I believe every other council within Devon currently do. Why should developers in Exeter, many of whom are national or international companies, receive free advice 
when that is not the case across the rest of the county. Exeter received 26 such major applications last year. In this context, the definition of major is more than 10 dwellings or more than 1,000 square metres of floor space. Plymouth City Council, for example, which charged between 2,028 and 3,723 pounds per scheme for providing pre-application advice on schemes of this size. For really large developments, 150 um, dwellings or four, or larger than four hectares, and um, that they have an even higher negotiable fee. A similar scheme would therefore more than cover the cost of a permanent planning enforcement officer. This proposal has been submitted in good faith, is a fully costed, reasonable proposal, which is aimed at improving the current budget and the service that residents are next to receive. So I very much hope it will get full support tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mitchell. If you would like to speak, could you indicate with the show, showing me your hand? It looks like there's nobody wanting to say anything, so I think that means we go to you, Michael. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I wish to speak, obviously, in support of this amendment. Councillor Sutton, uh, last evening when discussing the little application of the planning committee, made a comment with which I entirely agree when speaking about planning conditions attached to that application. She stated they should be robustly enforced. Unless we have an efficient, effective and efficient enforcement policy regarding planning conditions, they're really not worth the paper they're printed on. We know of no other local planning authority in England that does not employ planning enforcement officers. We are already short of planning officers, so we expect them also to enforce their own planning conditions, when at the same time, they're overworked at dealing with new planning applications working within tight timeframes. As Councillor Mitchell has already alluded to, this has led to a situation where we currently have a backlog of 160 enforcement complaints. The employment of the last few weeks of a temporary agency enforcement officer to deal with this backlog indicates that the administration is aware that this is an issue. What we are proposing is that the authority employ its own full-time enforcement officer, paying less for a full-time employee for 12 months than the cost of an agency employee for six months. In order to pay for this post, we are recommending that a charging regime is introduced for a pre-application advice that is currently available to developers free of charge. Based, as we've said, on the City of Plymouth scale of charges and the number of developments that have received free advice last year, the income raised will be in excess of that required to fund this post. These developers, many involved in multi-million pound schemes, already pay SIL and other charges related to their development. So an additional two to three thousand pounds is not going to deter them when, when the advice offered enables them to overcome potential planning concerns. A free application pre, a free pre-application service will continue to be provided for those that vote in smaller scale applications. In my own ward, I've been involved with local residents and the planning team regarding potential breaches of conditions on a large site. It took the local planning authority months to get a breaching order served and we're still waiting to find the results of that. We need an effective enforcement regime or we're in danger of undermining the excellent work of our own planning officers and our planning committee. I urge you to support this amendment. Thank you, Councillor Mi Michael Mitchell. Kevin, do you want to add anything as, as summing up? Um, nothing further to add. Okay, thank you. Phil, would you like to speak? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Just to say it's very difficult to be presented with an alternative at the last moment when a budget's been in the design for four or five months and of which many members, all members within this council have 
had a chance to participate. And uh, we're presented with this at the last moment. The portfolio holder for planning development will make reference to this in the main budget uh, presentation presently. And I think answers will be found there and that is the best place to deal with it. Uh, the, the ruling group will be voting against this amendment, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Okay, we will now proceed to the vote. Um, this isn't a named vote, is it, John? So all those in favour of the alternative, please raise your hands. Five, Lord Mayor. Okay, all those against this alternative, please raise your hands. Twenty-three, Lord Mayor. And any abstentions? Five, Lord Mayor. The motion the okay. alternative is lost. So that is could lost. I just, could I just ask Councillor Hannah if he could come into the main body of the meeting, if you don't mind? Cause, sorry. Yep. Absolutely. Well, uh, Councillor Hannah is walking down. We will now be moving to hear the second amendment to the budget from the Progressive Group. And I'll call on you, Diana, sorry, I can't there you are, yeah, to please propose your amendment. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like to propose the second amendment proposed um, by the Progressive Group, which has been developed in accordance with the Constitution and the procedures within it. Um, well, I, I think you introduce it, then we have a seconder, and then you speak to it through difference, which I've learned now, thanks to Councillor Mitchell's help. The proposal is that the council employ a full-time scrutiny programme officer, grade GH, post for 22-23. The total cost of this post, including on cost, is £42,828. The purpose is to support the scrutiny programme board, the scrutiny committees, officers and councillors to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the council's scrutiny function and contribute towards the council's objective of being a well-run council. The cost of the post, 22-23, may be met from the uh, from HRA unallocated funds of £4,282.80 and from the general fund final settlement of £38,000. £540, £45,020. The total funding required is £42,828. Thank you. Um, can I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Sparling. You've seconded. Um, yeah, do you wish to reserve your right? Okay, if you could now introduce and speak. No, you've introduced it. Could you speak to the motion, Councillor? Don't have much well one council is only as good as its scrutiny process. And one of the key roles of councillors is to hold the executive to account for that scrutiny process. Since scrutiny was reorganised in the last 12 months, a work plan has been developed, which is good, but the staff support to make it happen has been removed. The council has until recently a scrutiny officer, and now the council is struggling to progress the matters that need to be considered in detail such as the rollout roll out of the food waste service, the cost of St Sidwell's Point, the net zero activity, reviewing and taking leisure services in-house and air quality, etc, etc. The constitution, constitutional changes in 2019 also allow the public to come forward and ask questions, and many of the important community matters warrant much deeper consideration. A scrutiny officer will be able to help and support members of the public wanting to come forward to ask questions and join that scrutiny process and contribute to the improvement of services. The proposal is to be funded for a year by the very slightly higher than expected final settlement from government and a small percentage allocated from the HRA allocated budget. As although there is um, the Council Housing Advisory Board, which does enjoy the input of other organisations, this isn't a scrutiny committee, and there will be matters that the Council needs to consider in depth as the board itself identified when it last met. Of course, funding the post will be necessary on an ongoing basis. 
but we have not specified this in the motion, but we'd invite the portfolio holders to consider the following options. And of course, they will have ideas of their own to fund this important role. And to help, we would suggest the following options for funding this post throughout the life of the medium term financial plan. First, there has been recently an appointment of an additional SMB member, senior management board member, and there are currently two part-time secondments of SMB team members to another organisation. Therefore, it makes sense this financial year, as part of the one exit process, to review the SMB staffing requirement, not least with a view to reprofiling the budget to cover this scrutiny officer role, um, as well as the needs of a smaller council. The second option would be, which could be also done as well, is a review undertaken of the non-scrutiny boards and committees the council has established and the staffing requirements that these have in order to service them. Perhaps some of these boards should become council scrutiny committees or working committees reporting to them and the officer roles realigned. It should be noted that the Local Government Act allows for external members to be part of certain council committees so partnership working can actually be strengthened in this way. These are just two suggestions and my co-leader and I will be happy to work with the leader and other portfolio holders to examine other options too, rather than commit you to such decisions now, which might deter you from supporting this motion. We want to make it clear that we do see options for realistically funding this role into the medium term, but have focused our amendment on the principal issue of the scrutiny role to benefit the work of all councillors. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Diana Moore. Does anybody wish to speak to the, in the debate? I see no hands. Would you like to speak in that case, Councillor Spalding? <coughs> Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, it's been great to see the progress made over the past year on setting the scrutiny agenda, um, but it is concerning that the level of scrutiny activity to date has not followed this progress. Whilst combined committees have been useful to receive and scrutinise reports on broad topics like the budget, it's meant that the individual scrutiny committee functions have been cancelled and work delayed. This has had a negative effect on the important issues scrutiny oversees. For example, crucial proposals like Councillor Denning's review of support for those at risk of homelessness and or victims of domestic abuse have not progressed since the meeting held in October last year, despite a lot of work going on behind the scenes to push it forward. A scrutiny programme officer would help to keep this work on track. There is also a lack of feedback and follow-up from meetings, and I want to make clear this is not a criticism of our hard-working officers. It is a symptom of the insufficient resource the scrutiny function has been given. To summarise, please support this amendment to enable a scrutiny programme officer to allow reviews, especially those delayed, to move forward quickly and improve opportunities for feedback and follow-up from meetings. I am sure you will all agree that checks and balances on decisions and services through the scrutiny function is essential to ensure that all of us in Exeter receive good value for money from our council. This role would be pivotal in ensuring that value is confirmed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sparling. Do you have anything to sum up with, Diana? Nothing to add, thank you. Okay, in that case, I'll ask the leader, Councillor Gallic, to speak. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, my response is similar to the last amendment. Uh, if we had that discussion prior to now, throughout all this process, we may be in a different place. However, uh, you will see through the budget presentation the £7.65 million pounds that we have to find up until March 25, which in itself will be a challenge for us all. And references to uh, scrutiny, how we make that better, what we can do, I feel sure the portfolio owner who deals with democratic services and indeed Councillor Fong, who deals with some of the finances together with myself, will be able to contribute in that main budget speech uh, when we deal with that later. So. I'm sorry to have to inform you, the Labour group will not be supporting this alternative. Okay, in that case, we will now move to the vote. Could all those for the alternative raise their hands, please? 
six, Lord Mayor. Okay, all those against, the alternative, please raise their hands. Twenty-three, Lord Mayor. Okay, and any abstentions? motion is that alter alternative is lost. So that is not carried. So the next amendment will now be heard from the Conservative group. Um, I invite uh, Councillor Ledbetter to propose <coughs> the Conservative group amendment. Well, no, thank you very much. Before I start, can I thank Dave Hodgson and his team for his help uh, that we've received in, in putting our budget forward because it had to be checked. Uh, and thank you for all the work he's done on proposing the budget for this year. We know work goes into that. So thank you, Dave. So I'm happy to propose the Conservative Group's amendment, which is going to be seconded by Councillor Anne Jobson. And you'd like me to read them? Yes, please. Okay. So amendment to the budget. In excess there are over 5,600 exempt dwellings in respect of occupation, mostly by students. And if these properties are subject to council tax at band B, this would provide the council with an additional £725,000 of annual income. It is time the legislation was changed to permit this, because it's clear from tonight's resolution that tough decisions should be made. Now, the Conservative Group does not support the budget as set out by the Labour Administration, and the Conservative Group proposes the following amendments. A, provision should be made for the rollout of recycling of food waste across the city as a matter of urgency and without further delay. There should be support given to a programme to better educate residents as to what can be recycled. B, from the 15% community element of SIL, should be a program to refit and update the city's play parks. Such work to be completed within two years. The connect and wellbeing budget to be reduced accordingly. C, the feasibility study for the Wonford Community Centre should be reduced to £250,000 and refurbish refurbishment of the Wonford Centre should be budgeted for the year 2022-23 with no further delays. D, Funding from the savings in the above feasibility budget should be used for street cleaning, grass cutting, bin emptying, and the hard on green corridors and smaller green spaces for wildflower planting. And finally, E, provision should be made for Exeter City Council car parks or free parking on the first Sunday in each month. And that is our proposed amendment. Thank you, Councillor Ledbetter. Uh, Councillor Jobson, are you seconding? Okay, Councillor Johnson has reserved her right to speak to later, so I will now ask you, Councillor Ledbetter, to speak to the motion. Thank you, Walmart. I'd just say a few words. So I've already thanked the, the staff for what they've done in preparing for this year's budget. Uh, a city is judged on many things, and I accept that times are difficult. And I think I say every year that I accept the fact that the government is reducing funding year on year, and difficult choices are to be made. But we, we don't believe this is a poor city. If you look at the income from property, from car parks and others, this city has a lot of income. In many ways, um, evidenced by the money that's been put into flagship projects such as the screen hole and the bus station, which I agree we didn't, we didn't, we have, um, we didn't agree with, but only on the actual on cost. We recognise that in a, in a time like this, borrowing in the city is increasing, and if you look at repayments, in a few years, these are projected to double. We've got almost two million pounds a year. So those are the reasons we, we, we went in favour of these grandiose schemes. As I say, having said that, except that they're there now, but let us not ignore the other parts of the city. So we've got brilliant stuff going on in the city centre, and I hope that in due course, further things will happen, and no doubt the leader will be able to explain to us what's really going on around the swimming pool. And what I'm sure he doesn't want is just a white elephant swimming pool sitting in the middle of a a wasteland. So I look forward to hearing about that um, and how that's going to move forward because, as you know, many ideas have come forward what we do with the rest of that area, open spaces, market spaces, performance venues, etc. So I look forward to hearing that. But as, as we've said, let's not forget other things that the city needs. The city is judged on many things. And whilst we've done these, these, these lovely big ticket items, we seem to have forgotten some of the everyday things such as emptying the bins. I use an experience in Topsham where the bins are overflowing often and we're told again and again that there is not enough money in the budget to get those bins emptied. I'm told that the, there is not enough money in the budgets to 
cut the grass. They say there's not enough money to, to roll out the recycling of our food waste. So what we're asking for is a reallocation of some of the money into these essential everyday things that keep a city looking good. Um, and that is the, the basis of our amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ledbetter. Could you show your hand if you wish to speak in this debate? Uh, it seems not, so I will ask you, Councillor Johnson, to use your right to speak. Thank you, Lord Mayor. There's an inherent unfairness to a system of local taxation where two groups of people benefit from services without contribution. In Exeter, they are the 5,600 exempt dwellings, mostly houses of multiple occupation occupied by students and students living in purpose-built student accommodation. They are exempt from council tax, uh, and in the case of the latter, there could be an alternative argument that they should be chargeable to business rates. They're not chargeable to that either. It should be one or the other. Um, we know that we are in difficult times and we know that many years in the past that because uh, of the exemption that councils local government got additional resources but over the years they have diminished until they are virtually undecipherable in the government's grant and if we were charging those 5,600 exempt dwellings at band B, bearing in mind a great many of them would cover more than that there would be an extra £725,000 worth of annual income. This does not apply, and I make it clear, that this does not and should not apply to campus accommodation or to similar hostel accommodation such as any hostels for victims of domestic abuse or that sort of um, item or perhaps halfway housing where there would continue to be exemption. It is time, in great respect, for the system to change so that the settled Exeter residents are not, in effect, contributing more than they need to enable the above, the above groups to have access to local services and to see their own services uh, cut and diminished because of budgetary constraints. Unless there is a change in legislation, it's highly probable that budget debates in this council and others up and down the country will continue to have to make very tough choices. And we hope that all will support pleas for a change to the legislation. So that deals with the preamble. Dealing with the meat of the amendment, we do say that there should provision be made for the recycling of food waste, exodus recycling rates remain appalling. 27.8% was the figure reported in October. East Devon is 60%. Food waste collection should be rolled out across Exeter before the end of the coming financial year and curbside glass collection should be rolled out before the end of the 2024 financial year. The Conservative group believes that this should be a priority. It is said on the doorstep over and over again, why can't we have what they have in East Devon with um, sufficient co uh, food, food waste collections. <coughs> Moving on to the community infrastructure levy. Um, it's a shame walking around the city and looking at the play parks. These are glorious little spaces, but so many of them look shabby. One in my ward had a roundabout that was uh, fenced off for months and months and months because there weren't funds to report it. It makes the whole site look un untidy. It dis discourages people from going there. And we all know that during the pandemic, the one thing that uh, parents really did need was the ability to go somewhere safe with their young children and let them run around. So it is quite clear that the community infrastructure levy, which 15% should be used on community uses, should be used for an urgent programme to refit and revitalise the city play park. It can't be done overnight, but maybe within the course of the next two years, all those play parks would be revitalised, some perhaps more up-to-date equipment in some, Parents would then have that space to take their children somewhere really local to have some fun, somewhere they can walk to, somewhere where the kids can run around and kick a ball. It's clear.
clear that if part of the 15% still goes towards the revitalising the city's play parks, that there will have to be a reduction in the connect and wellbeing budgets that are also funded from that 50% of silk. But I would suggest the advantages to young families of having modern, fully functioning play, park, play parks will be enormous and will do an awful lot to improve well-being in certain communities within Exeter. Moving on to the one for community centre, I always have a problem with these large feasibility budgets. The problem with a feasibility budget is it's not actually doing anything, it's talking and spending money and talking more about doing something. Um, when the feasibility is over and done, it's far too often that there then isn't the money to do what the feasibility study recommends doing. If Wanford, as they have indicated, would like a refurbished, revitalised community centre, then they don't want to wait until their children are in their teens before they get it. They, they want to have something and they want to get on with it now. So we suggest that by reducing that feasibility study to make it meaningful, to have a clear objective as to that study as to what is being looked at, what is to be refurbished, getting proper costing, would then enable next year's budget to set aside the funds to do the work on that community centre, rather than waiting for years and years and years. There would be some funding in the current year that would be saved. And again, looking at the need for wellbeing, um, what has proved a considerable interest to a lot of residents is to have wildflower planting, to have some shrubs and bushes on the little small green corridors that you see all over Exeter. Uh, by enhancing those by some more street cleaning, uh, we see the litter pickers out. You know, we have an army of litter pickers in Exeter. They go out uh, in all weathers. They're removing enormous amounts of rubbish. We're very grateful to very grateful to the officers of Exeter City Council who come along and remove that rubbish afterwards. But if there was some more street cleaning services, perhaps there wouldn't be too much around. And all of that would, in my suggestion, have a positive effect on people's health and well-being, as well as being a step along the road to net zero. Um, the last part of that is simply this. We know that car park receipts have fallen during the pandemic for obvious reasons, and that whilst they are starting to rise, Footfall within the city centre, to the shops, to the restaurants, to other leisure facilities is perhaps not as high as it might be. And we need to have an, a, a way of attracting people who have perhaps been going elsewhere back into the city centre and by this small uh, gesture towards that, it might help towards revitalising the city centre. It's a small but simple initiative but uh, I think it would be welcomed by both residents and businesses alike. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dobson. It's not my role to enter into a debate, but either as a fact or a point of clarification, I would like just to mention uh, something you missed out about play parks, and that is that Exeter leads the way on inclusive play facilities, where disabled children can play alongside their siblings and peers. I think that is an important clarification in your description of our facilities. I, I, I'm grateful for that. I think they are so important, whichever ones they are, they really do provide a lifeline to all the families. Certainly, thank you. Um, I will now ask Councillor Ledbetter if he wishes to add anything in a summing up. Um, Lord Mayor, I mean, I thank you for your intervention. It shows your passion about play parks and why would Labour Council not support these amendments. You're all passionate about your communities, you believe in net zero, you want to see community cases being improved, you want to keep extra tidy, you want the grass cut, the Lord Mayor supporters. And so please support them because they're the men. Thank you. I think the grass cutting is something we maybe need the bees to comment on, but let's just leave that and ask Bill to speak now. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, there is a number of remarks which uh, the Labour group will be opposing uh, this amendment. A number of remarks have been made about recycling of food, waste, cutting grass, and I look forward to listening to the portfolio holder in the main budget proposal um, telling us all about that. And I know the portfolio holder well, 
he will tell you in detail all about that, and quite rightly so, is the same with the 15% communities budget. This is not a magic tree that can be shaped. So the portfolio holder for that will speak about that, and the Wongford community. That's about engagement, and I feel sure uh, the portfolio holder for physical activity will come in on that uh, later on in the, in the debate. Just to say, Lord Mayor, this is not a balanced proposal, and I would most probably believe it would be illegal. I am not party, and my group will not bring forward something illegal. The loss of a hundred and uh, £70,000 a year uh, with Sundays being removed would have a ginormous effect upon the budget. I suppose, in finally just saying why we, we will be, there's just one thing missing, and that is the free ice cream also on Sundays to all children. That should have been put in there. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Can I have a point of order? A point of order from Council Lepper. Leave us at the point it's illegal. We've had it checked. So. Could you, could you give a justification or could an officer please rule on whether it is illegal or not? I accept that remark, Lord Mayor. If, that's not the, if it is the case, if it's balanced, it's balanced. Okay, that's been accepted. Thank you very much. Um, I like the ice cream idea. It's not um, we now move to the vote. So if you are for that alternative budget, please show them by raising your hand. Aye, Lord Mayor. If you are against the alternative budget, please show by raising your hand. Um, I'm not sure Councillor Begley should be taking part in the debate. Okay. Can you hear all of the debates? We don't mind. Sorry. Twenty-nine. Okay. And any abstentions? Alternative is lost. So that, in that case, we shall now return to the recommendation set out on the front sheet of your agenda, which is proposed by Councillor Bialik. Um, I believe Councillor Wright would like to second it. Oh, it's been done. Great. we have kept that in my brain. Um, and I'm now going to ask Councillor Bialik to speak to the budget and then open the debate. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, tonight I intend to present a balanced budget for the next financial year. Highlight another year of achievement for the city and set out why we expect more success in the year ahead. It has been a year of recovery for Exeter as we cautiously start to move on from the pandemic. We are seeing the rewards of the work we did with our partners across the city last year in supporting and coordinating the response to the crisis. This has given us the best possible chance of a sustainable recovery. Footfall has almost returned to pre-pandemic levels. Exeter continues to have one of the lowest shop vacancy rates in the country. Business in the city are expressing high levels of confidence in the future and for good reason. Of course, the pandemic has impacted on our finances just as it, done, as it is done for everyone else. Our medium-term financial plan identified a need to deliver a combination of a reduction in budget in, and income generation to address the £7.65 million budget shortfall by the end of March 2025. Our One Exeter programme has been designed to deliver the predicted budget reduction and income generation required, and this work is well underway. As well as addressing the budget challenges, it also captures previously identified organisational development work that we plan to introduce at the Council. It will allow us to fully focus on our key priorities. Delivering a net zero carbon city, <coughs> building great neighbourhoods, a healthy and inclusive city, city, a place where people want to live, to work and to visit, a city of community and great quality of life. Lord Mayor, before I outline the budget we are proposing to set tonight, I want to reflect on some of the successes of the city has enjoyed over the last 12 months and to highlight some of the things 
we have to look forward to. As I mentioned at the start, the economy in Exeter has bounced back strongly and our partners in business, community, are, report, are report, res, reporting strong levels of optimism for the future. Car parking in the city is currently 83% of pre-pandemic levels, with a footfall back to 82%. Exeter is the city with the highest growth in population in the UK. And we have the second lowest uh, claimant rate in the UK, 2,265 compared to 2,869 job vacancies in the city and 9,150 vacancies in the travel to work area. In the last 12 months, average salaries for Exeter residents increased by 6.4% to £30,825. The average workplace salary increased by 6.6% to £31,000.33, well above the surplus average. However, there are people in Exeter who are still struggling with the cost of living crisis, particularly those on low wages. We need to ensure that support is still there because fuel poverty has always been an issue for many and is recognised by myself and this council. Whilst we don't agree with the way in which the government is introduced the energy crisis payment, we continue to work with them on this. Lord Mayor, between 2019 and 2021, despite all the problems caused by the pandemic, the number of businesses in Exeter increased by more than 4%. We continue to support people into work. Our Exeter Work Hub opened in the city in April 2021 to support individuals affected by the pandemic. More than 200 people have since been supported by the new service. Located within Exeter Works is the Youth Devon Youth Hub, offering targeted employment and training advice to people aged between 16 and 24, managed and funded by Devon County Council and the Department of Work and Pensions. I'm pleased to say funding has been extended for another year. The City Council is also a Kickstart Gateway organisation. We have supported 90 young people into Kickstart placements, some with our own council. Working with our partners, we continue to drive forward the skills agenda for Exeter and support careers in the construction industry through our Building Greater Exeter partnership. I am proud of the work our staff have done in supporting businesses through the distribution of government grants to those who need them. Our teams have distributed 8,486 grants to businesses, totaling just short of £50 million pounds of vital support distributed directly to those who need it most. This is a fantastic achievement of the staff. Over the last year, test and trace payments have been distributed to 709 households in receipt of benefits a total of £354,000. A further 468 low-income workers received £234,000 between them to support support while self-isolating, including 184 parents who received £92,000 in total to allow them to stay at home and look after their children needing isolate, isolating. Lord Mayor, we all know what will be happening shortly as a consequence of the Prime Minister's decision yesterday. The Household Support Fund, which has been administering since November of last year, has so far helped more than 550 low-income families with a cost of essentials. More than £180,000 have been awarded towards food, fuel and other essentials. More than £150,000 have been paid out in discretionary housing payments to support over 300 low-income families in rented properties to remain in their homes or move to more affordable accommodation. Our communities programmes continues to support all of our residents by providing a wide range of funding and assistance to frontline initiatives which make a real difference more of which I will outline shortly. 
Lord Mayor, despite the obvious need for new homes, we will continue to ensure that future development in Exeter protects the vital green ridge surrounding the city. These spaces are so important to Exeter. We do not want urban sprawl. We want sustainable living in our city. As I have said before, green spaces and the hills around Exeter are the thing that defines the city and are such an important amenity for the residents to share. According to the Centre for Cities, Exeter is now the number one city in the UK for increase in housing stock. This is reflected in the council exceeding the delivery test with a score of 155%. This alone is a massive achievement. Importantly, we recently began consultation on the strategic op options for our new local plan. This sets the expectations for the city's future development, highlighting important issues around placemaking in the city, net zero, biodiversity, connectivity, and active tri travel. We intend to consult as widely as possible on this. Everyone should feel that they have a chance to shape the emerging local plan, our city plan. It's our plan for the whole city, and we need to make sure that everyone owns it. We will reach out to all of our communities, neighbourhoods and businesses and we want them to come with us on this journey that we plan the city together. In April of this year, our new Director of Planning and Development, Ian Collinson, will join us from his current role at Homes England and we very much welcome his arrival. The new Director will give renewed Im impetus to our Liverpool Exeter programme, which is focused on delivering a series of new, sustainable neighbourhoods and communities within Exeter, building a garden city, building on the garden city principles. These will be mixed use communities, delivering up to 12,000 new homes over the next 20 years, with spaces for people to live, work, play, and for businesses to grow and prosper. It aims to realise our ambition of delivering clean and sustainable growth and ensuring that development responds to the character of the city and its setting. Lord Mayor, we have our plans for livable Exeter coming forward to create new homes for people in Exeter. That's what we intend to do in, in the future. This year we secured £1.6 million pounds worth of funding for the progression of the Council Housing Retrofit Programme the upgrade of council properties to achieve carbon neutrality. And 370 properties will be completed by April of this year. I'll say it again, 370 properties will be completed by April of this year. The retrofit program will continue over the course of the year ahead with another 250 properties targeted for the completion during the following year. <coughs> That's 250 properties during the following year. I didn't want anybody to miss that point. This is great news. It's an exciting program that will be a huge benefit to tenants at a time of spiralling fuel costs and enables us to make a real difference in tackling the energy crisis for residents in Exeter. It is also another small step on the long road to achieving our ambition of a net zero carbon city. We recently did, uh, completed the development of the Council's Extra Care Housing Scheme, Edwards Court, 53 one and two bedrooms flats providing support for those who need it. This passive house care facility is another UK first for Exeter, and I'm so pleased that we plan to start letting these apartments in the near future. With so much happening, it is easy to overlook a development of such importance as Edgewood's Court, which is of course named after Peter Edwards. This is a massive project that will provide essential extra care at home for those who need it. Our own development company, Exeter City Living, continues to step new standards for housing in Exeter. Work has commenced on 21 new passive house homes at Hamlin Gardens, 
The site has been cleared for the commencement of 92 homes at the, the Gardens Whitton, Vaughan Road, also by Exeter Living. This will be the very best quality council housing, lifting re residents out of fuel poverty, creating brilliant homes, and reducing our carbon footprint. I couldn't be more pleased with these fantastic council developments. We continued to contribute 260,000 to the YMCA development in the city centre for 26 much needed self-contained one bed units that will be opening shortly to residents. Again, I'm so pleased that we've been able to work with the YMCA Exeter to provide an Exeter of excellent affordable housing solution for young people in the city. Our council tenants continue to benefit from the hard work and dedication of everyone involved in our housing service. Over the last year, we have introduced the new tenants and leaseholders group known as Ten Tenants Voice. We've agreed a new resident involvement strategy and we've introduced a council housing and development advisory board made up of councillors and housing experts who provide effective governance to housing services. These are all important initiatives ensuring that tenants are actively involved in all aspects of the service. In the year ahead, we will hold a review of our tenancy policy and strategy and will introduce a new neighbourhood strategy. We are planning to form a council-owned residential property company which will help to assist people who don't qualify for council housing. It will help those who cannot afford a deposit to buy a house and who want to live in good accommodation with a good landlord, secure tenancy and with a sensible rent which reflect the area. Much work has been done over the last year assisting those with housing needs and the homeless. We maintain delivery of frontline homeless services with assessment and emergency accommodation throughout the pandemic by remodeling access routes for clients. The council has purchased 16 new units of accommodation under the Rough Sleeper Accommodation Program and has been awarded an additional 2.5 million for, a 30, for 32 further units. We have worked with the new housing provider for Exeter City Community Trust to attain over £500,000 government funding for supporting homeless people into housing. A trailblazing pilot housing and support project has been established with CoLab for vulnerable women fleeing domestic violence and abuse. Last year also saw the successful accommodation and support of displaced residents from the Exeter bomb incident. In the year ahead, we are bidding to secure three years' worth of funding for services, targeting an end to rough sleeping in the city by 2025. A new homeless strategy for the city to be co-produced with stakeholders for launch, hopefully, this autumn. It is down to the strength of our team at the council that secures these funds for Exeter. We are working with Exeter Community Trust and other homeless providers to, de to deliver 50 plus additional accommodation units for single homeless people. We are working with the Exeter Homelessness Partnership and local commissioners to improve the range and integration of services for local homeless and vulnerable housed people, including recovery services in education, training and employment. Lord Mayor. I just want to spend a moment reflect on the work of our frontline staff. The past two years have been an incredibly difficult time for many of our frontline services. But the dedication and hard work of staff and services, such as waste operations, public and green spaces, CCTV, engineering and environmental health, has made key services have continued to be delivered to our communities and businesses. Throughout the last year, refuge and recycling services have been maintained throughout the city. We actually managed to expand our services. Last year, we rolled out the first phase of the food waste collection service to 1,300 properties in Alfington. And in January, we introduced coffee pod recycling from homes to offer to, re to residents 
and the chance to lower the impact of their home coffee consumption with weekly uh, collections. As part of our commitment to the environment, biodiversity and a net zero carbon future, our tree planting continues citywide, with more, more than 680 trees planted across our wards over the last year. The pandemic has made us realise how important public and green spaces are, not only for our mental health and well-being, but as important places to meet and to socialise. That is why at the heart of our work over the last 12 months, we have invested in making these places our city even safer and more vibrant to people to enjoy. It is great to have recently completed a project to restore the iconic Pince's Gardens gatehouse to its former uh, um, glory. Please go down and take a look. Other major investment has included £140,000 on pitch improvements in Pinhoe. £233,000 spent on supporting the reopening of the High Street through the Welcome Back Fund, including street cleaning, graffiti removal and Covid secure measures installed across the city. £482,000 awarded by the Home Office to our Community Safety Partnership, Safer Central Exeter to improve CCTV, establish community and student watch schemes, enhance the business crime partnership, radio network, improving lighting and public space enhancements. £72,500 awarded by the Home Office to tackle crime against women at night. Exeter can take great, great immense pride in having just been ranked as the cleanest city in a national survey. The recognition acknowledges the tireless efforts of our staff to clean our streets and the pride residents have in their neighbourhood. More than 260 litter pickers were loaned to residents in 2021, with over 900 in the last five years. One of those has my name on it. This is a fantastic partnership between our cleansing teams and our residents, which is producing amazing results. Building great neighbourhoods and supporting our communities continues to be a key priority for the Council. The Exeter Grants Programme aims to support community groups and organisations to use their passion, skills, experience and knowledge to focus efforts on working sustainably to make a difference and create change. The long-term impacts are to reduce disadvantage and inequality, disadvantagement and inequality, improve health and well-being, increasing individual and community resilience, and we continue to fund the Citizens Advice Centre in Exeter and supporting the fantastic work they do. Exeter Connect, which supports community and the voluntary sector groups in the city to grow and to develop and well-being Exeter, which works with the communities to support the well-being. And again, I acknowledge the funding from the Devon County Council, which makes well-being Exeter work. Working with the communities, we've been able to assist with the creation of the fantastic new community facilities in Hebertry and Belmont. We are working with the community in Pinhoe to examine the options for a new hub. And we are working with the community in Wanford to establish a new health and well-being hub. A great deal of consultation over the period of time, delivering what the expectations of people in that area will come forward. In the last 12 months, grants from our strategic fund have helped transform community buildings and spaces across the city, including for positive light projects in Sibyl Street, Exwick Community Centre, and Sibyl Street Bakehouse Stroke Cookery School. Hundreds of small award and small grants have helped to fund projects which can make a big difference to the quality of life in our, in our neighbourhoods. Much of this work involves supporting different cultures in Exeter, which is absolutely essential and fantastic. In total, a spend of £1 million a year supporting the work of those who are doing so much in our communities. I can't thank them enough for the work that volunteers and organisations have done in supporting 
people in Exeter throughout the pandemic over the last two years. Lord Mayor, our ambition to achieve a net zero carbon city by 2030 remains a top priority. Exeter was given the royal seal of approval when Prince Charles came to visit the new Exeter bus station in July and saw for himself some of the amazing environmental initiatives helping to deliver our net zero ambitions. <clears throat> a new net zero team has been established within the council along with the launch of our new of our net zero ambassadors to support the journey. A grant of £661,500 from the public sector decarbonisation fund has allowed us to upgrade the council's building management systems which will lead to further reductions in our carbon footprint. We are working with the Centre of Energy and Environment at the University of Exeter to create a corporate carbon reduction plan to meet our net zero 2030 commitment. Along with other Devon authorities, we were part of a successful £9 million consortium bid to provide energy efficient improvements for around 200 owner occupied and privately rented properties in Exeter. We were delighted that around £2 million of the consortium's plot, uh, pot was allocated to Exeter. Construction is starting on the 3.5 million water lane and smart grid and storage project. Using a, social, uh, a solar array, this will provide renewable energy supply to the council's operations depot at Exton Road support to support the future electrification of the council's operational fleet, including refuge collection vehicles. We'll charge our own fleet of electric vehicles using the electricity we have generated and stored ourselves. This is a fantastic project and is another step on our journey towards net zero future. In the year ahead, we will launch a new public electric vehicle charging strategy for Exeter, introduce three new electric refuge vehicles as part of the plans for electrification of the waste collection fleet, launch a city-wide marketing campaign through building greater Exeter to target young people to consider a job in construction. Complete £500,000 upgrade to the council CCTV infrastructure and start working, uh, start work creating a new columbarium within the new Heavetry Cemetery at, have, uh, in Heavetry. Our centres and venues continue to recover strongly from the pandemic. Supporting the city centre remains critical, crucially important. And as well as our major investment in transforming the old bus station site, we are still examining options for the regeneration at the top of South Street. It is great to see the Corn Exchange returning to stage productions, and the team have opened a fantastic new office and ticket agency in the vacant retail unit in Fourth Street. Our vision for the Corn Exchange is to make major improvements, increase the capacity, and create a top-class city centre theatre and entertainment venue. As well as enhancing the city's entertainment and cultural offer, regeneration of this part of the city centre will be important in providing a great experience for residents, residents and visitors to our, uh, to our city. This is our vision and we will be working on this over the coming year. The Matford Centre has been boosted by help by increased levels of businesses from the livestock auctions. The team at the Custom House have worked very closely with Exeter Canal and Key Trust to develop a wide range of cultural events. And our popular red coat guided tours resumed after a long break. Exeter continues to be a city of culture and we are very proud of our status of a UNESCO city of literature. We remain committed to the continued development of the cultural sector with our partners. A community-based arts organisation was recently appointed to consult with residents and artists on creating a new public art strategy for Exeter. The city has, show has been co showcased nationally when the tour of Britain completed a stage in the city centre last summer. That was a fantastic afternoon for us all. 
our successful program of jazz on the key will be returned and in the year ahead we will see the return of large events including Pride, Respect, the Exeter Marathon and Winter Wonderland. Exeter will of course celebrate the Queen's Jubilee in June. The city continues to be a major visitor destination. Traffic to our Visit Exeter website increased by 66% in 2021. This is almost 10% up on pre-pandemic levels. Great Western Railway are match funding a new £10,000 campaign to encourage visits to Exeter by train. A key focus for the Council over the last 12 months has been our leisure service. <coughs> We've invested heavily on staff and facilities over the recent years and we have successfully bought all leisure employees under the direct control of the Council. I and we are extremely proud to now offer outstanding facilities for everyone in the city. Our residents have also now responded. There have been 4,500 new membership joins since April of last year. Our new leisure app has had 21,000 downloads. The Riverside Pool reopened in July of last year after a massive rebuilding project. Since then, more than 800 thousand visits have been made to the centre. All of our centres have been significantly improved and rebranded. We continue to have an integrated approach, approach to leisure, health and well-being in partnership with Live and Move, the Sport England delivery pilot. It is helping the key Council's key priorities of promoting active, healthy lives and building great neighbourhoods while working to reduce health inequalities across the city. The Iska Centre gym to be fully, uh, has been utilised fully as a refer facilities for GP and social prescribing referrals, and £750,000 has been committed to the next stage of work of the Wanford Wellbeing Hub, which will see the redevelopment of the existing sports centres. Lord Mayor, this brings me on to the one thing we are most probably proud of. Um, a white elephant, or whatever that some who want to call it, a grandiose scheme that people may refer to it, but that is the imminent opening of the St. Sibyl's Point. It's worth remembering that together with the new bus station, which successfully opened in July of last year, this £50 million redevelopment is the biggest single investment the Council has made in a generation. St Sibyl's Point will be one of the best facilities of its kind anywhere in the world. Built to Passive House standard, this iconic low energy building is redefining standards in the leisure industry. When it opens in just a few weeks time, people will be astonished by the quality and the, and the facilities on offer three pools, 100 station gym, fitness studios, luxury spa, rooftop terrace, and stunning views across the city. It's a big statement which says that in the years to come in the city centre, our city centre will be different. It will be about experiences and not just buying things. It is sad, Lord Mayor, that many other people will not share our eagerness on this site. That's why we are prepared to invest heavily in the, in the future of our city. People who visit the leisure centre and then go on to visit the city is what we want to see. St Sibyl's Point and the new Exeter bus station are assets for the city and provide a real focus on our city centre. They are a massive boost for all our residents, visitors and people who work here. The new leisure centre will play a vital role in our recovery by supporting the city centre and acting as a catalyst for the redevelopment of the wider area. I'm also proud to see that it's about to open its doors shortly. Lord Mayor, as you have heard, there's a lot happening in Exeter and I wanted to remind everyone of the work we are doing together with our partners in order to realise our ambition for the city. And now I will move on to the details of the budget itself. I am again proposing a balanced budget for the next year. This has not been easy, 
The government's own core spending power calculation shows that even by increasing our ta council tax by the maximum five pounds per year available, the council will only have a tiny increase in the amount available to spend on its services. Inflation increases alone account for an increase in spending requirements of £624,000. The proposed budget identifies 1.3 million of reductions in order to address the lack of an increased funding from central government. The new council, sorry, the council has been awarded a further 1.362 million in new homes bonus, taking the total earned by this council to close to 29 million pounds. On top of that, we are still generating nearly three million more in business rates growth than the government believes we need to provide vital services in Exeter. However, the government is about to present modifications to the new homes bonus scheme and is still intent on overhauling the business rates retention scheme, meaning that the financial benefits that we have enjoyed will likely be lost from 2023-24 onwards. This means further reductions of 6.35 million will be required over the next year and years to balance the budget. I propose to you the recommendations set out in the papers before you in terms of the approval of both the revenue estimates and the capital program for the year 2022-2023 and which will result in the setting of a district council tax of 170 pounds and five months for a band D property. This is an increase of five pounds per year for Van D property, less than 10 pence per week. By comparison, the county council preset will rise by 45 pounds 18 or 87 pence per week. The police by 10 pounds a year or 19 p a week. And the fire service by 1 pound 79 or 3 p per week. Therefore, the Van D council tax will be split as follows. Exeter City Council, £170 five months. Devon County Council, £1,556.46. Devon and Cornwall Police, £246.56. Devon and Somerset Fire Service, £91.79, making the total council tax bill <coughs> of £2,064.86. Finally, Lord Mayor. I want to thank the Chief Executive, the Directors, and all the staff of our Council for the work they do, and everything they, they have done in this very difficult circumstances over the past two years. I'm very proud of what they have achieved. There is a lot of talking coming from Central Government of levelling up devolution and the 12 national missions to increase productivity and employment and reduce inequality in the country. In Exeter, we have been working on all these areas for the past 10 years and will continue to do so. We are leveling up for the citizens of Exeter, delivering for everyone in the city through, our, through all of the things I have mentioned in collaboration with all our partners to ensure Exeter remains a great city that we can all be proud of. Lord Mayor, that is the budget proposal that I moved this year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bialik. We now move to debate. If anybody has anything to say, if they raise a hand. Oh, yeah, because Laura's reserved her right to speak. I have got that right. So if anybody would like to say anything, I see Bob Hull, Councillor Hull, would you like to speak first? Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah. OK. Is that working? Yes. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, like Councillor Bialik, um, I've been a, a local councillor since the early to, to mid 1980s, and I can honestly say that I've not seen the budget put together in a more comprehensive and cooperative, ma cooperative manner in that time. Um, I'd like to thank the officers, as Phil did, um, people such as Bindu, Dave Hodgson, and Joey Ellen, who spent over 20 hours offering me their guidance and their advice. I'd like to thank our Labour group um, for the three Labour group meetings we've had to discuss the budget, for the two days workshops that they gave the time <coughs> um, to, to, um, 
to get the heads around things. I think it was well over 100 hours work by elected members working closely with officers. We all know that tens of millions of pounds worth of cuts have been made to local authorities, including ourselves, um, over the, by successive governments. A further seven and a half million over the next three years that Phil alluded to meant we had to consider all areas, particularly when looking at the medium term financial plan, discretionary services and other services. Um, it could have resulted in us closing all the remaining public toilets. It could have ended with us abandoning things like the graffiti budgets. But I'm delighted to say that the savings made will streamline frontline operations while protecting jobs and services. I recommend this budget to you unreservedly. Thank you, Councillor Fole. I now ask Councillor Morse to speak. Um, as I've probably told you many, many times, I'm very proud to live in this city since I was born. I'm proud to have spent my majority of my life here, and I'm even more proud to be a city councillor. I'm also very broad, uh, proud of this council and what it manages to do on very tight budgets. I'm proud to be a member of that Labour Council. Not only do we manage to make these tight budgets, but we are... We ably assisted by our finance directors and directors able to make adjustments and amendments throughout the year as need may come. As mentioned earlier in the meeting, we have been this year found a member of staff to clear a backlog of uh, enforcement cases and it is said within six months that we would hope that we clear this backlog. We also employed a solicitor as a planning solicitor within the local authority to assist with this as this was part of the issue that we were experiencing. The current system we have should be workable once this backlog is cleared and therefore the need for another full-time member of staff would be unnecessary. The idea of charging for planning applications is not new and was not heard for the first time today from the progressive group and as portfolio holder I have been discussing this matter with the uh, members of the planning team to look at how we move forward on large applications, freeing up offices with more time, therefore, to help them process those applications that they need enforcement. Our City Council achieves many great things, not least St Sibyl's Point or Edwards House, and I'm very proud to be a member of it, and I'm very proud of this budget, which I would love to be much bigger and doing much more fancy things but based on what we have, our officers and this council have done the best we really can. So I'd like to thank them all and commend this budget to you all. Thank you, Councillor Morse. Councillor Ward, I call you to speak. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like to start off, I think, by congratulating the leader on succinctly capturing the, the massive and extensive amount of work delivered by this council and also the work planned to be delivered. Um, it may have been a long speech, but there's so much to fit in. Um, well done. Uh, the council works effectively delivering not only the mandatory services it's required to deliver, but also a wide range of discretionary work creatively delivered to meet identified needs all within the unprecedented constraints by relentless funding cuts inflicted on local councils by this government. There's so much to say, I will keep my comments to my own portfolio. The leader has mentioned a lot of the information and, and uh, background to St Sidwell's Point. It is an amazing building. I think I'm on record on, on various uh, publications saying it's jaw-dropping. It is, and the only thing it needs to complete it is to see Exeter citizens in there enjoying it. It sets the standard for future leisure complexes. It's not just climate ready and environmentally groundbreaking, it's incredibly cost effective, and it's 70% less running costs than contemporary like-for-like -like buildings. It will recover its build cost and much more over its lifestyle, over its life cycle. There was some great coverage actually in a, nation, in a national trade magazine and it had such a, sound, a good sound bite that I had to share it. And it went, 
Extra Council trailblazes a radical alternative to energy guzzling swimming pools. I did like the, the, the ring of that. So in addition, community involvement at Wanford has identified a redesign of the current facility to make it a community hub, increasing community use of more integrated community centre and leisure facilities, as has been mentioned. Riverside coming into full use and the leisure service this administration bravely brought into the council direct control and provision, which is going from strength to strength. A number of the statistics that demonstrate that, that progress was uh, presented by the leader. Live and Move, a partnership project, demonstrates the value that this council places on the health and well-being of all residents through encouraging more active lifestyles and focusing mainly on those most in need. I would like to finish by recognising the amazing work by the teams and individual officers within the area of work that I'm responsible for who have delivered such amazing work. There are so many names to give, so many examples of the difference this team makes. But there is much more to come and I definitely uh, I'm proud of this, go this uh, council, I'm proud of the work that we do, I'm looking forward to doing more, and I recommend this budget. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wood. Councillor P.S., can I call you to speak? Thanks, Lord Mayor. Uh, and thanks to those who have spoken uh, already in this debate. It's given me time to uh, just reflect and take a moment. There was so much information came from the leader to take in just a couple of things you know it's just the volume of projects that we've managed to deliver to enhance this city completely staggering you know especially when you consider they've all been achieved against the backdrop of savage cuts that were started when the Lib Dems were in coalition with the Tories the wind has changed and now they're lined up with the Greens and we're still dealing with it the current crop continued to slash with their loan shark chancellor that they've got now it's shocking what's going on to the, to the services in this country. But what really stood out for me was something in my ward, the ward I represent, Doriad St James, is a real demonstration of this Labour Council's commitment to social justice. £260,000 invested in partnership with the YMCA to deliver much needed self-contained accommodation for residents searching for the stability that will allow them to flourish and grow in our community. You know, I must thank the Lord Mayor for the invitation um, a few weeks ago which I was lucky enough to, uh, to have the time to take her up on, to have a tour of that facility. Absolutely blown away. The standard of accommodation that will be supplied, it has everything a young person growing up in our city would need, provided by a responsible landlord at a rent that they can afford. It's a fantastic example of this council taking funds that we've actually got, not ones that are promised at some future point and waving them around on a leaflet, actual delivery. Finding a way to improve the lives of young people social justice in action in our city being delivered by our council. There's more that I can go on to and I'm going to try and sort of limit this because otherwise we'll be here all day. <laughs> you know, and I see there's lots of people that want to speak but I think it's important to not just focus on what's going on in my ward but what's going on across the whole city. The continuation of the retrofit programme absolutely amazing 370 properties will have been completed before the worst impact of this conservative government's cost of living crisis hits this city in april just as families energy bills will be skyrocketing as the price cap is hiked by a whopping 51 percent 693 pounds a year action this council has taken will be reducing energy usage for so many with thousands more set to benefit next year Instead of forcing loans onto those who do not want or cannot afford them, we are genu genuinely reducing people's bills. Again, social justice in action. While others talk or actively make people's lives worse, here in Exeter, this Labour, Labour administration keeps making things better. I'm going to stop there. There's plenty of other people who want to speak, so I don't want to touch on too many topics because, as the Lord Mayor rightly pointed out at the start, we don't want repetition. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. I call upon Councillor Harvey now. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I find it quite appropriate 
some educational establishment this evening because it takes me back 40 years to when I used to sit in lecture theatres like this and be amazed by concepts being explained and things that I didn't understand being shown to me as Councillor Bialik has done this evening. I understood and knew what was going on, but I think a clear and concise explanation of exactly where the budget is next year. So those sort of things happened to me 40 years ago. Also 40 years ago, I sat and marveled at things I didn't understand that completely perplexed me, that threw me completely the wrong way. Well, some of those I'm going to explain to you because Fortunately, as Councillor Bialik said earlier on, I do have some detail around some of those things that have perplexed me this evening. Um, shall we start with an inference that food waste has not been rolled out across the city through lack of finance? That is incorrect. The funds are there and have been there. The issue is we can not get vehicles. We have one, we have another one arriving hopefully in May, it is ordered, but supply chains are what supply chains are. We cannot acquire vehicles. Now, I am not going to comment on why, apart from the fact that it's a shortage of semiconductors apparently. Now, semiconductors are one of those things that perplex me, I can't understand those, but we cannot find vehicles. <coughs> We also can't find drivers. We appointed two new drivers during a week, and by the beginning of the next week, they had been poached by our competitors. We can not find drivers. However, there is some good news for those who wish to talk about food waste, and that is that officers are aware that there is disquiet because this, the service has not been rolled out. And the barriers to this will be the subject of the next strategic scrutiny meeting on March the 31st. And it will be discussed in detail. This has been on a forward plan, so you should all know about it. But I'll give you the date again. Strategic scrutiny, March the 31st. You can come and hear the exact detail of where we are with that. Um, there are other issues about rolling out of food waste. One of which is we are not 110% responsible for this. We are, as I'm sure you know, the collection authority for waste, and the county council is the disposal authority. So we need to work with the county council on disposing of waste, and because of the nature of the concept of food waste, we need to work with the environment agency on ensuring we have the appropriate licenses and details. We can continue to roll the service out. That is not what is holding us up. I have told you what is holding us up. Okay, so that's food waste, right? I will, well, I will, I will. Right, so there are, there's a government bill which has food waste, possible free garden waste collection, particularly supported by rural authorities, deposit return scheme for, there are many plastic bottles and glass bottles that people are drinking water out of, and produce a responsibility for waste. The Conservative government is a master of prevarication and delay around this project. I heard today, having heard two and a half years ago that this project was an inception, that it won't be complete until 2005. Now, I'll give you some detail. So, 2025. Well, I'll give you some detail around some of the difficulties this causes us. Councillor Bialik explained to us that we are buying three electrically powered refuse collection vehicles which will be powered by solar energy from our solar field which is part funded by a majority funded by a grant from the EEC. Uh, read you if you like. Those vehicles cost in the region of £480,000 each. Now I am not and the Labour Group is not going to sign off expenditure on vehicles of that magnitude, and we have 16 in the fleet, until we know exactly what will be required of us, because I am not going to have a situation where our fleet is inappropriate because we have made injudicious decisions, and we will not do that. So that's where we are with food waste, garden waste, deposit return scheme. So that's the first thing, right?
secondly, let's go to the, the 15% community element of self. Well, one of the things that Councillor Pierce left out, out of his little list of things that went on in his board was the complete refurbishment of Westgarth Park in the last financial year. So we do refurbish play parks. And if anybody would like to see it, this is the programme. This is the programme that we have laid out by our officers for the refurbishment of our parks and the play areas. Right? And I find it almost offensive that people should think that the fact that equipment is cordoned off is our fault. Equipment is cordoned off because it is unsafe and there is a supply chain required in getting, in making sure that we have the appropriate kit and equipment to refurbish, to mend or to replace that equipment. To assume that it is the fault of our officers or lack of funding from this council that that is happening is inappropriate and incorrect and people need to be aware of that. So that's that. Right, now let's talk about um, street cleaning, grass cutting, being acting and things like that. To say that it is lack of funds, again, is completely inappropriate. Many of you have remarked on how much cleaner it looks around the cathedral these days. Would well, you know why? It's counterintuitive. It's because we and the cathedral have taken the litter bins away, which has not provided a point for people to stuff McDonald's papers and other fast food establishment um, waste into those litter bins and to find that they spill out and create uh, people take it home if there isn't a bit. That's what's happened. That's what we're doing, right? Rewilding. A lot of grass has not been cut deliberately because we are rewilding. If people want to find out exactly what's happening about this, come and talk to me, come and talk to the officers. We will explain there are deliberate processes for doing these sorts of things. Um, and finally, um, on, the, on this issue, um, free parking on the first Sunday in each month. Um, well, at Hattock, and I believe it was in the autumn meeting, the County Council brought forward a proposal to liaise with the City Council about car parking charges and hours of parking so that there was no imbalance, so that, for example, somebody wouldn't be charged double to park on the street on on-street parking and the price that they would be charged for off-street parking so that there would be a balance between the two. So, if we want to have a look at the first Sunday of every month, let's look at the County Council and see if they do on-street car parking free on the first Sunday of every month. That isn't all. The work done by our staff is unbelievable. Over the last year, this is something I haven't mentioned for some time, and I'm sure my colleagues will be very pleased that I haven't mentioned it, Ash Dieback. You have not heard about Ash Dieback. We have just gone on and done it. It has happened. Right? And many of you will find that you get notices in your, in in your, in your, your inboxes and your email accounts saying that somebody's coming out to do some work, and, 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 and that has been done. And even as far as Storm, Eunice, and whatever else happened over the weekend, Bridge Road has had a lane closure this last night and today because our engineers working in conjunction with the County Council and the Highways Authority have had the nets that prevent footballs and other balls and stray, uh, stray items from the, from the playing fields there going out onto the highway. The wind has destroyed the upright post that holds it up and we have had, with the County Council engineers, been on site road closure for, for, for Bridge Road to ensure that the city remains as safe and the highway remains as safe as we possibly can make it. The budget that you have had presented to you today clearly, concisely and accurately is to be commended. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor. I think you shut the yaps, but I think everything you said was really important. But I would remind the future speakers that we have another meeting after this, so please be as brief as you can. I now call upon Councillor Bizard. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I will try to be quick and scribble lots of stuff, but I will cut it as short as I can. Um, there's so much to welcome in the budget. Thank you for it. It's, uh, yet again, evidence of a Labour Council delivering for, for residents. Exeter's success and its resilience and the vision we've heard about tonight 
is uh, it, it, despite the, the savage catch from central government, despite the pandemic, is, is yet more evidence of what Labour can do in power. So that's, that's fantastic and it's extremely welcome. Housing. Um, the opposition parties don't want to talk about housing um, because it's a, it's a huge success story for Exeter. Passive House, we heard that word so much this evening. Fantastic. Edwards Court, extra care, homes, everything that Exeter City Living is building, tackling homelessness, uh, the residential property company that's uh, um, being uh, developed, the Liverpool Extra programmes, the, the uh, vision for a garden city, all fantastic hope housing um, issues, positive stories for the city. The opposition parties don't want to talk about it other than in a negative light and uh, or to spin misinformation in their uh, glossy leaflets, which is a pity because there's a lot going on. Um, and just to, uh, also to mention in, in, in my ward, uh, in Newtown St. Letters, we've seen improvements to our parks in both uh, Ball Meadow and Belmont Parks to play equipment, which is enormously welcome and has made a huge difference to, uh, to families, particularly in those areas. So thank you for that. Um, and not least our community building, which is a few years old now, but really, really getting going. In Belmont Park, it's uh, made a huge difference. Lots and lots of bookings great life it's come through the pandemic brilliantly it's uh, it's it's making money it's doing extremely well so uh, and that was uh, thanks to a lot of council funding um uh and just finally i just want to echo thoughts that have been said already about our uh, our, our fantastic officers um the people who've pulled together the the schemes uh, often with very short notice from central government legislation complex legislation they've had to understand and to put into practice really quickly thank you to them they've They've uh, been a lifeline to, to many residents um, in the city, to, to businesses, to those uh, struggling, uh, to renters, uh, to people self-isolating. So uh, thank you to them. And just to touch once finally on on, um, on what the officers um, and what the services in our city do provide for people, um, just to, to read out a, um, a short email I received uh, a month or two ago from a resident, just saying, I, I just want to record how much we have appreciated the incredible service for refuse and recycling in our ward. It has been fantastic and in nearly two years the only miss was a compost visit once only, or well, nobody's perfect. I don't know how the council have managed to supply such a service throughout all the COVID problems and staffing issues. It has been brilliant and I hope this message can be sent on to those responsible. I did email the council a few weeks ago, but never had a reply. So there's obviously still a bit of work for us to do there. But uh, just a, an example of uh, very positive feedback. Thank you very much. I'll stop there. Thank you, Councillor Bizard. Councillor Gusain, I'll call you now. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to be very dull after all of this. Um, Could you be I, dull and brief? That and would be and <laughs> I would be very, very brief as usual. Uh, I'm just going to say I'm very, very proud that this this council, despite the tight budget they are still continue to be spending fine resources to spend on discretionary, discretionary services particularly to support a grassroots uh, uh, projects in the community and the arts i've spent all last week literally going from one art activity one community activity to the other to the other one of the days i spent literally all day from 12 o'clock till nine o'clock at night spending to creative projects across the uh, Exeter. There's so much creativity, so much innovation, so much enthusiasm, uh, and so much community spirit all around. All you have to know is to know about it and just visit one or two and you will see what I mean. So that's all I wanted to say, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gusain. And I think finally, Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Lord Mayor, and I'm going to be very brief. Um, Councillor Bialik has already mentioned the 8,500 grants totalling nearly £50 million that were awarded to local businesses to help them through uh, with COVID. Uh, just to give um, colleagues an, uh, an idea of the ongoing work that we're doing in this area, we found out last week, we heard that the Chancellor had um, <coughs> uh, uh, agreed a further top-up so we hear the same time as the public hears, and, and so we've been very fortunate to get another 
1,800 uh, pounds to allocate. But what that actually means is that we have, we've been told we've got to devise a new application form, we've got to get the applications in, and two officers and I will be going through those to ensure that they're um, are valid, there's uh, no fraud, uh, and so on. So another 187,800. Uh, the other thing, just to let people know, is that uh, Councillor Bialik mentioned um, that we are bidding to secure three years' worth of funding for services targeting the end of rat sleeping in the city by 2025. Well, at this very moment, we have an officer who's burning the midnight oil to get this 3.7 million um, uh, bid in by Friday. So, again, I have to thank all the officers for their amazing work, and quite honestly, um, if it weren't for district councils like Exeter City Council, we would have been stuffed during the pandemic. They have worked their socks off to provide support to the people and businesses of Exeter. And I would ask everybody um, in this meeting now to put their hands together to thank the work of the Exeter City Council officers and their staff. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. I now ask Laura. Oh, was there any other? Uh, well, no, Laura reserved her right to speak. So, do you want to speak, Councillor Diana Moore? Okay, I'll call upon you, Councillor Diana Moore. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I think you need it for your speech. Indeed, there are many great things that the Council is doing, and I would completely agree with Councillor Williams that district councils are vital. Of course, well, I think we are all agreed, and it's pleasing that we all agree that net zero is a priority. And Councillor Pearce mentioned social justice. That is really important because inequality in the city is rising, and I am very concerned about the impact of, of um, rising poverty um, and low incomes in St David's Ward in particular. So we have to keep really focused over this next year. And I think we need to be aware of distractions. Councillor Vizard mentioned that the opposition doesn't talk about, about housing. I talk about it quite a lot. I also talk about it quite a lot in the Council Housing Advisory Board, but of course we wouldn't know about that because the minutes are kept secret. I'm also very concerned it's a very good meeting, actually, so if anybody wants to come along, I would suggest come observe. It's very interesting. I would be aware, very concerned about one of the distractions, which is to propose, is the money that is being spent on the proposed market rent company that is allocated in the budget. The leader said that it would be rent at appropriate levels for the area. If that housing is built in St David's, it will result in more of St David's residents feeling they have to move out of the city. We have to really focus on basic services to provide excellence to excellent standards. And we mentioned many things this evening about the discretionary services, such as the graffiti removal service, and that's a vital service for St David's, which unfortunately um, has one of the highest levels of graffiti in the city, but it's really important that it's cleaned up to ensure um, that um, it doesn't exacerbate problems of antisocial behaviour. Discretionary services are absolutely vital, particularly in the more deprived areas of the city. So within the budget, we do need to be alive to the fact the level of debt is rising to £254 million. And this is included the purchase of commercial buildings, not something I necessarily disagree with. But the income um, from these just covers the interest payments. And by taking on more debt for other activities, we need to actually ensure that they contribute surplus income, which can further support discretionary services and not just servicing interest payments. We also have some big questions within this budget to tackle, to consider around the net zero agenda. Exeter has made a start, and I really welcome that. And we need to make sure that the £47 million capital budget funding, funding allocated within the budget is assessed for its carbon impact during construction as well as the, the construction life cycle. I'm disappointed 
that our amendment for scrutiny wasn't accepted. We need to have a more transparent process. And the leader mentioned the Liverpool Exeter Place Board. The scope of the board seems to have drifted and expanded since it was set up a couple of years ago. The leader also mentioned that the hills around Exeter are iconic and to be protected. But also we need to look to the river and the quay in the River Valley Park that runs through it. It is these images that are on the council's website and promoted on behalf of the city. With much of the work of Liverpool Exeter proposed to impact on, on this area and throughout St David's Ward, we need to make sure there's a transparent process of decision making to inform these future plans so that people can be brought along with them. The role of the community sector has already been mentioned and I think I need to bring to people's attention of the proposed cuts to the community grants budget. In 2019, the budget was over a million pounds. In 21-22, it's 322,000. And for this next year, it's now 204,000, so a fifth of what it was a few years ago. It, this year, it will be made up of 189,000 neighbourhood still, 15,000 from the general fund. If this budget is approved, it sends a message to the community and voluntary sector partners that they're expected to do more for less. And I think that's a poor message when the community voluntary sector have stepped up so much during COVID and played a vital role in, in providing services, supporting communities and enabling inclusivity and reducing inequality. And when we proposed our motion, the leader mentioned dialogue. If we are going to manage and get through the next few years, which is proposing £6.5 million pounds worth of cuts. I would welcome further dialogue. In fact, I wrote to the leader at the beginning of this month suggesting that we have further leaders' meetings. There hasn't been one for a very long time. So, Councillor Bialik, I'd be very much welcome the opportunity to meet further and talk through these issues. We have followed the process set out in the Constitution and we would welcome further dialogue to address these issues that I've raised and the other things that will come up throughout the year, the challenges that we face. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Diana Moore. Councillor Ledbetter, I'm just going to ask you to wait one second because I believe Councillor Gousset needs to clarify something. Is it a point of clarification? Uh, yes, clarification, yeah. because uh, Councillor uh, Moore has uh, uh, mentioned uh, the wrong, uh, incorrect, inaccurate uh, uh, numbers. Uh, a community uh, grant uh, program had started with one million, but that also included uh, 260, uh, 260 for uh, well-being Exeter, 180 for Exeter Connect, and 200 extra citizens. Uh, services so all of these are within that one million what is being cut is not these contracts what has been cut in this year is the amount that is left to give to uh, the ward grant to the grants in general just the grants portion that is now 229,000. Uh, uh, that's the, the one that has got less the reason why this has got less is because we have not got uh, uh, home a uh, new home uh, new home uh, bonuses that has been cut dramatically. So that is what has been going out of that. So uh, that was incorrect. Still, it's about uh, uh, nine hundred thousand or thereabouts. Still, in total. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Gusain. I don't think we can. Wait. Is it another point of clarification, a point of personal explanation? Well, it's a point of clarification. I'm just reading out the figures that I was sent to in the email from Councillor Kassane this week. And that the budget was 189,000. Sorry, okay. Sorry, that email was exclusively for the grants, not for uh, the, uh, the, the commissioning of the different services. The different services also, we didn't mention them because they were exactly the same. The, all the services were still the same. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. 
Thank you. Now, uh, Councillor Ledbetter, thank you for your patience. I'm very happy to wait. Thank you. Um, I, I think we, yeah, we, we should acknowledge that the City Council is doing an awful lot. I thank Councillor Alec for highlighting it to us along with his um, portfolio holders and, and we don't wish to denigrate that. Um, it's also several times we mentioned how much money we're getting in grants from the Conservative government. So even at the very end somebody talked about the Chancellor and bidding for £3.7 million pounds to do with homelessness. So let's not forget that all this um, all this, the economy bounced back, the, the shopping numbers, etc., were all, all on the back of the Conservative government that, that is supporting this city. And I think that we should just not forget that. A lot has been made of the grants that are coming into this city, millions and millions of pounds worth. Um, so let's not just forget that. I felt I just should mention that. Um, we should also not forget that this, this, this is a budget that's being slashed in this city, that the leader spoke about 1.3 million pounds of cuts. So cuts are being made, and let us not turn extra into a city of two halves. Let us not forget the people who are on our streets. Let us not forget the people who can't get houses. Let us not forget the people who are struggling with fuel poverty, etc. And I hope this administration will address all those issues. Um, finally, if we can talk about some of the issues we mentioned, the grass cutting and the, the collection of uh, food waste, Councillor Harvey, came up with, with lots of reasons why, is that, why that's not happening. And again, if there are real reasons, all I would ask is it's communicated to people. If there's a reason why we're not doing food waste collection because of the vehicles, then we need to be told. And I just hope we're not waiting to 2025 for that to be rolled out. If there's a reason why we're not cutting the grass, etc. Again, all I would say is, if that is communicated to the other members, because bear in mind, we did not have the, the benefit or the, the two days of workshops on how the budget is made up, we, we, we are not treated to nearly as much information as the, the Labour members. So what I would say is, as well as doing all these good things, perhaps we could communicate a bit better to all the members in this group. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ledbetter. I think now Councillor Wright. No, I don't really want to check this. No one else I'd rather not notice. I, I just am aware that we haven't even started our second meeting. And if we're going to do justice to the topics in the second meeting, we can't go on and on because we'll just get too tired. So if anyone else is desperate to speak, please show your hand. No, we have to. Laura has her reserve right and Phil will sum up and then we will move to the vote. Councillor Wright, would you like to speak? Thank you, Lord Mayor. And I will be brief. I would have been brief, but a couple of points have come up that I really need to now include. But going back to the budget speech when we heard it, I sat here um, astounded and I listened with great pride at this speech from Councillor Bianic. The work being undertaken to continue to enhance and improve our city is quite astounding in the climate of funded cuts and while facing the pandemic over the last two years. Through the diligent work of our officers, under this administration and leadership, we've been well placed to do all of these things that have been listed and described in the leader's speech. Through the faith and trust plus placed in us by the electorate, we've been able to do these things and we hope to continue that into the next democratic year. I want to just quickly thank the officers from the housing team. Um, I won't go into any more excited descriptions of the retrofit programme, because you know that I could talk for that on that for years and a development programme but I would like to thank the housing leads Adrian Pengelly and Lawrence Blake and the directorship of Lindsay Arjun. Um, I'd also like to thank the Democratic Services team um, under John Street and under the directorship of Farn Al Kafaji because they've managed to keep our democrat democratic process going throughout the changes in working patterns, legislation, guidance and expectations of us as members and of the public in the last two years. Alongside this, they've also coordinated a really good training programme for all councillors, not just the Labour group, but all councillors. This information sharing and opportunity to have briefings about the budget, service areas, and our duties and requirements as councillors under the, under the Localism Act 2011 has been absolutely astounding this year. And there's more work that is going on to evaluate that process and to continue to make it better. 
I would urge any members of the opposition who haven't yet filled their boots with this opportunity to please do so, as being better informed will of course help the process of good scrutiny. Thank you very much to those officers and to um, all of the officers of the council and I would like to hand you back now to the Lord Mayor. <laughs> Sorry, Thank you, um, <laughs> Councillor Wright, for being relatively brief. I believe, uh, Councillor Bialik, do you have anything to say? I, I, will be, I will not give another long monologue about it all, the Lord Mayor. Uh, just to thank, I thought the uh, the portfolios that we've got ex executing their roles are fantastic in this city. Just to say, I've just checked with my telephone provider. It does take incoming calls, leaders of the other groups. I can take incoming calls on it. Try ringing me sometimes. I do reply to your emails. You know I do. I will be setting up meetings. I've already spoken to. Uh, John Street about that but you know <coughs> if we're going to work together and I would like to you know what is there nothing we do that is good because I don't hear anything coming from the other are, are, is it all rubbish what we're doing no no well that's a good idea but this I can accept that do you know what if you continue to rubbish everything you got this is why it's like the way it is now so Lord Mayor, please accept and put this one to the vote, and I hope it's passed. I'll accept your point of clarification, Councillor Bionic. Councillor Bionic, the first thing that I opened with was thanking you for your speech and the many great things that this council has done. And I'm saying that again in case it is needed. Okay, thank you for that point of clarification. We will now move to the vote. I remind you that the law stipulates that a named vote is required when the council is setting its budget on council tax. So can I ask you, John, to do the necessary? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Mayor. Members could clearly say to me whether they're for... Coming. Oh, nine. That's right. I'm there. I'm there. So if members could clearly say whether they're for, against, or abstain to the motion that Councillor Bialik has put forward, please. So Councillor Alcock. For. Councillor Atkinson. For. Councillor Begley. For. Councillor Bialik. For. Councillor Branston. For. Councillor Buswell. For. Councillor Denning. For. Councillor Fole. For. Councillor Cassane. For. Councillor Hannaford. For. Councillor Harvey. For. Councillor Holland. Abstain. Councillor Jobson. Abstain. Councillor Lefetter. Abstain. Councillor Light. For. Councillor Martin. For. Councillor Kevin Mitchell. Yeah. Kevin Mike. Sorry. Councillor Michael Mitchell. Again. Councillor Diana Moore. Again. Councillor Jemima Moore. Again. <coughs> Councillor Morse. Four. Councillor Newby. Abstain. Councillor Pierce. Four. Councillor Sheldon. Four. Councillor Sills. Four. Councillor Sparks. Abstain. Councillor Sparling. Abstain. Councillor Sutton. Four. Councillor Bizard. Four. Councillor Wardle. Four. Councillor Warwick. Four. Councillor Williams. Four. Councillor Wood. Four. Councillor Wright. Four. The Lord Mayor. I don't think I get the right You'll stay there. Oh, I <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Councillor Bialik, you're up. That's 24 in favour, Lord Mayor, 5 against, with 6, six abstentions. The motion is carried. Okay, thank you. I'm sure everybody will be hot. You heartily relieved to know that I will now declare this extraordinary meeting of the council closed and I will also declare we take a 10 minute comfort break before we move on to the ordinary meeting so if you could all be back here by half past eight that would be great
I will remind you all that it's already 20 to 9 and the staff of Exeter College will want to go home at some point. And I would like to thank Exeter College for extending their hospitality this evening. I've been enjoying looking at the screen at the back, just glaring our partnership. If you want to, I realise now there's one at the front as well. Well, right, so nice to see that. Uh, may I ask if a member is prepared to move the minutes of the meeting held on 14th of December as a correct record of the proceedings? Anyone well, willing to move the minutes? Move, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Have I got a seconder? Thank you. All in favour? Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, the next item at item number two is to advise you of some official communications, otherwise known as what I've been doing. I was honored to attend the Holocaust Memorial Service on the 27th of January with the leader and the chief executive and honorary old men in what was a very moving service in Exeter Cathedral made more moving by the presence of young children singing. Um, as has already been mentioned, Exeter has been recognised in the national survey as being the cleanest city in the country, testament to hard work of all those involved, and why each year the Lord Mayor hosts the Sweeper's Lunch. I'm grateful to David Shoyer, who provides the McDonald's Lunch. I'm sorry to tell you that Ivor Doble, oh, Iva Doble, the watchmaker, jeweller, and a keen sports fan passed away on Sunday after a life well lived, a real Exeter character. I send my condolences to his family and friends. I also attended dinner at Limpstone Commando Camp and the King Squad Passing Out Parade with Mark Devin accompanying me as consort. Mark and I found both events moving. I will say more about my new understanding of our military at the end of my Lord Mayoral year. For now, I will just tell you that it was nearly me that passed out at the Passing Out Parade. I began to feel distinctly unwell. I put it down to a late night, followed by a very early morning. In fact, later that day, I tested positive for COVID. Unfortunately, I passed it on to my mace sergeant and probably too many proud parents there to see their young sons and daughters, although I think they were all men on this occasion, uh, pass out. I remind you that, that COVID has not ended and I thank those of you who took LFTs before attending tonight. An exhibition in the Guildhall was held to mark the 70th anniversary of the accession to the throne of Queen Elizabeth II. Also, I would recommend anybody who hasn't seen that episode of The Crown, it's really worth watching and very educational. I am very grateful to Councillor Yolanda Henson who attended the special choral evensong service in the cathedral as I was unable to be ill with COVID. I congratulate Kareem who was made a member of the British Order of the British Empire in the New Year's Honours List for services to local government. <laughs> On occasion as Lord Mayor, I have felt moved to pen a ditty, and this is one such occasion. It's New Year's Eve and all is well. I look at Twitter and bloody hell, my eyes widen as they see the screen. Kareem's got an honour from the Queen. Exeter's amenable, articulate gent, honoured for services to government. Congratulations, I raise my glass to our CEO, simply world class. <laughs> uh, now then, I remind you that my coffee mornings to raise money for inclusive Exeter continue, and there is also a fair trade coffee morning to raise awareness of fair trade issues on the 5th of March. If you're busy canvassing on Saturday mornings, never fear. You have the opportunity to support Inclusive Exeter by booking places and enjoying a curry at the Ganges on the 8th of March. Tickets are going fast. All you need to do is email me 
at my councillor email, it's £20 a ticket, £15 of which goes to Inclusive Exeter. <coughs> I believe I've got one other thing I wanted to say to you. Um, yes, number nine. Do, do, do. Oh, yeah. It is unusual for a Lord Mayor to mention McDonald's twice in one council meeting. I've already thanked David Choyer for his generosity with the sweeps lunch. However, I must mention McDonald's again for two reasons. Firstly, because I was invited to reopen the refurbished McDonald's at Marsh Barton, after which David Sawyer gave an amazing donation of £2,000 to Inclusive Exeter. Secondly, because they now do a vegan plant burger, which is delicious, gluten-free and climate friendly. And I think that concludes my official communications. So I will now move on to the next item on the agenda, and agenda num number three, which offers the opportunity for members of the public to submit an advanced public question. You will recall that Tony Cox asked a question at the beginning of the extraordinary meeting of council, rather than being required to wait until now. So I can confirm that we have no other public questions for this meeting. The next business on the agenda are the meetings of the various committees of the council that have been held over the last couple of months since our meeting in December. Can I please remind all members that the relevant chair will present the minutes of their meeting on block and then ask if members have any questions to raise on matters which have been resolved or in respect of any recommendations there will be the opportunity to debate on those matters. If not, I will move on to the next chair to do the same. However, when it comes to the meeting of the executive, the leader will present the minutes one by one, drawing particular attention to each and every recommendation so that members and the public are aware where decisions by full council need to be taken. An individual vote will then be taken on each recommendation from executive to council. Can I now call on Councillor Warwick to introduce the minutes of the licensing committee, please? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I wish to present the minutes of the licensing committee held on Tuesday, 1st of February, 2022. Are there any questions? Thank you, Councillor Warwick. No questions. So I now call on Councillor Denning, who chaired the meeting of the Combined Strategic Scrutiny Committee and Customer Focus. Chair. Sorry, Lord Mayor, am I not supposed to move them? Oh, I think you probably are, yes. <laughs> I've got a script, you see. Thank you. I'm glad they informed me. I to move, Lord Mayor. <laughs> Can we have a second there? Seconded. Those are moved. Thank you, Councillor Warwick. Hopefully I'll remember for all the other minutes. So now I call on you, Councillor Denning, who chaired the meeting, as I said, to introduce the minutes of that committee held on 10th February as agenda item number five, starting on page 17. As the majority of these minutes formed part of the discussion on the budget at the earlier extraordinary meeting of the council, it is simply a matter for these minutes to be noted. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Okay, uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. I wish to present the minutes of the joint scrutiny meeting held on the 10th of February. However, there is an error within the minutes. Okay. Um, on part seven of the Treasury Management Strategy Report, um, there was a recommendation for a motion that was passed, but it should read that a recommendation be made to the Executive and Council that Link Group include consideration of the climate impacts of investments and banking activity within their advice provided to Council. Those minutes will be corrected. <coughs> Are there any questions? No questions. Do we need to move those? It's, as was the case with Councillor Warwick. I'm to move Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Seconded, please. Okay, seconded by Michael Mitchell. Uh, those minutes are moved. There's any problem? No. You don't need a second. Okay. Um, 
right. I now call on Councillor Bialik as Chair of Strata Joint Executive Committee to introduce the minutes of that committee, held Thank on 19th of January. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Minutes of the Strata Joint Executive Committee on Wednesday the 19th of January. There are two recommendations in there that need to be, and I would move the recommendation, uh, Lord Mayor, in minute six. Okay. So, if, as there are two recommendations, I second that, Lord Mayor. Um, yeah, I will take them one at a time. Yeah, uh, Councillor Wright is helpfully seconded. Now, I'm trying to remember, we did say we would do this in a certain order. Councillor Starling. Is it a question? No. Lord Mayor, it's a recommendation, so it's open to debate. Yes, but are we are we doing the rec first recommendation, then the second one, yes. and then any questions about the rest? Okay, so I can see you want to speak, Councillor Sparling. That's great. Would you like to... Oh, hang on, I don't have to ask if the second... Do I have to ask Laura if she wants to reserve her right to speak later? Well, in theory, you could do, yes. Lord Mayor. Yes. But, um, okay, Councillor Wright, would you want to speak now? Or I'm sure you're right. To okay, I think I've got it now. Councillor Sparling, please. Apologies, um, it's on point eight. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to confuse me. Point eight. Oh, I see, I see. Right, so we're going to go to the first recommendation, which was, do, some, do I need to read this, John? No, Lord Mayor, no, the recommendation. Moved it, Lord Mayor. It's in your papers, it's moved, it's seconded. Yeah, can you all vote on it, please? Can all in favour show? Thank you. Unanimous, yeah, Mayor. that's unanimously passed. Brilliant. Do you know what? Do thank, you, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like to move minute eight business strata plan. There are a number of recommendations here. I uh, I understand there are some questions. We need to be careful in case if they are of a financial nature, we will have to go into part two. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I so move. Right. What would you advise, Joe? Second, Lord Mayor. Yeah, second there is Councillor Wright. Would you advise us to go into part two? Well, it depends what I don't I don't know yet until what the questions okay. will be, but I'll just ask the questioner to be careful of that advice that if it's a part two matter we would need to exclude the press and the public. Okay. Council Starling, would you like to ask your question if we can in part one? Uh, thank you very much, Lord Mayor, and apologies for the uh, confusion that I caused. Um, I'd firstly like to congratulate the leader on taking the chair of this partnership um, and secondly ask in regard to minute eight on page 24, that as all of the authorities in the partnership have declared a climate emergency, will the new business plan include an assessment of the carbon emissions of the business activities and any measures to offset them? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Well, Do you want to answer that now? No, I'll, I'll answer it waiting. now yeah. by saying that there is a governance review and a number of things being reviewed at Strata. Um, the business plan was brought to us by the board uh, to the leaders and to be perfectly honest and uh, it was already there. There was, it, it, I believed it was the wrong way round and we're now looking at that situation. Um, the detail of that was not discussed at the meeting. I will try and get you an answer. What I do know is, uh, thank you for congratulating me being the chair. I'm only the chair until June. We haven't met uh, because it's a rotating cycle. Um, but it may be the last thing I may be able to do on the way out, Councillor Sparling, is find that out for you. Okay. Anybody else want to speak? No? Is there anything you wanted to say, Councillor Wright? No. No, no. <laughs> Councillor Bialik, anything to say? No, no, just to clarify, I'm on the way out as chair of the Strata. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so. okay, um, right, well, we'll move swiftly on to the vote. 
Um, won't we, John? Give me some reassurance. Yes, please, Lord Mayor. Yes, okay. All those in favour? I think that's unanimous. Right. Yeah. So that is. I move the minutes. I beg to move the minutes, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Okay. A second Yeah, a second So those minutes are moved. Right. Thank you. Can I call on you again, Councillor Bialik, as Chair of the Executive, to introduce the minutes of two executive meetings. The first being held on 11th of January at agenda item 17, starting on page 27, except for minute eight, which was considered at the earlier extraordinary meeting of the council. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Executive of the 11th of January, minute one, minute two, minute three, minute four, minute five, minute six. Excellent more, more thank you. Okay, yes, uh, can I call upon you, uh, Councillor Diana Moore? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Sorry, first, Lord Mayor, I just need as a recommendation. Minute six is a, minute six is a recommendation, Lord Mayor. Mm -hmm. It's got two parts to it, and I so move the recommendation. I second them. Okay, so we're on minute six, which yes. has two, one recommendation. Councillor Moore has asked us, Diana okay. Moore has asked to speak. Uh, in that item. Okay. Uh, if you would like, I'd be calling you to speak now, Diana. That would be helpful. If you would go ahead. Thank you, Lord Mayor. So my question is, can the leader clarify minute six, please? And I will just briefly explain why. So the minute on page 28 says the council will be looking to how retrofitting will be done for non-council owned property. But in my follow-up email, the leader confirmed that it's not considered prudent to pursue business cases through Exocity Living in respect to the consultancy company and a retrofit company at the present time. However, it is not a forever decision and the funds remain in place for Exocity Living to do the viability work if and when it is deemed appropriate for them to do so. As we don't have forever to tackle the climate and now the cost of living emergencies, Will the leader let us know when it will be deemed appropriate to examine the case for a retrofit company? Would you like to answer that now, Councillor Would I be Would I be finishing the debate if I do? No. No. Okay. I'll give you the chance to sum up at the end. Of okay. Time. Can I take the question? Can I sum it up at the end? I think it's yes. quicker for the yeah. meeting. Does <coughs> anybody else want to take part in this debate? No, in that case, uh, unless Councillor Wright wishes to speak, then we'll ask you to sum up and answer the question. Thank, the thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Yes, this has been a matter of an exchange emails, and uh, the Audit and Governance Committee were right in their assessment of that position at the time. I can tell you now, as I think I did in my email, and publicly say no, it is our intention at some stage to form a retrofit company. We've seen many uh, retrofits around Exeter and I'm beginning to think why can't we do that? Why can't we work with colleges? Why can't we bring forward a green agenda, a green skills agenda in Exeter? Why can't we do that? Well that's my sort of strategic thinking on it. I want to do that. I need to work with other partners and set the case forward. And um, it is Unfortunate that because of various cuts, we have not got the capacity to go into that at the moment. One thing at the time, and we have got the development, uh, sorry, the uh, Exeter City Living, which I want to see going forward. Business plan is coming uh, to the executive and to the next council. I want to see that going. We've also got a residential property company going. Uh, we've got quite a few, as my speech on the budget told you, quite a few plates spinning at this moment in time. But I can assure you, as to everybody in this room, that that is the intention that I would like to see anchoring jobs and sort of future green skills in this city and wider Devon, if at all possible. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Bialik. We will now move to the vote on that recommendation. All in favour? Looking unanimous to me. Yep, that's unanimous. Yep. Okay, that is carried then. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Minute 
at 7 the 22-23 uh, budget strategy. There is a recommendation here which I formally move, Lord Mayor. Okay, so seconded. Seconded by Councillor Wright. Is there a recommendation so we can debate it if anybody wishes to speak? No. Can we move straight to the vote? Oh. Nope, sorry. You want to speak or do you want to move to the vote? Okay, all, again, all those in favour. Uh, Members can clearly show if they're voting, please. Okay. Twenty-seven, Lord Mayor. Any against? None, Lord Mayor. Any abstentions? Two, Lord Mayor. Okay, that is clearly carried. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Minute eight has already been dealt with previously in the budget, uh, Lord Mayor. Uh, number nine, Lord, minute nine, housing rents and service charges, 22-23. There is recommendation with three parts here, Lord Mayor, I formally move. I second it. Okay, so we can move to debate. Anybody wish to speak to this recommendation or about it? Uh, Councillor Diana Moore, please. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to ask the portfolio holder, um, for those on a housing benefit, the rent rises will be covered. And so what assessment of the impact um, of the rises have, has been made on council tenants that are just on universal credit or in receipt of no benefits? And would the portfolio holder consider delaying the implementation of these rent rises for a quarter to enable people to catch up with paying their winter fuel bills? Would you like to answer that now, Councillor Wright? Uh, yes, I will. Thank you. Um, the impact assessment of the increase of the rents can't actually be done until the rents have been increased. Um, but we have got officers work that will be working with everybody to assess that um, outcome. If anybody's in difficulty, we have officers and some funds there to support, as we have been doing through, through the pandemic and before with our officers, with our tenants, sorry. Um, I'm very sorry, I can't remember what the second part of the question was. I just wondered what thoughts have been given to um, delaying the implementation of these, this rise for a quarter. Oh, right, thank you. No, I'm afraid that we can't because it's already been approved in this part of the HRA budget. This has come to the Housing Advisory Board, as, as you know, Council Mark, because you're on it, um, and up through its second now to Council. We, I have asked and gone back to the directors to see if there's a possibility of being able to do that. I'm afraid that we can't because it would um, impact on the whole budget setting. But I would like to um, reaffirm my reassurance to you that any adverse impact on our tenants will be um, supported and handled as best we can in the light of the fact that the cost of living crisis will not be necessarily caused by this rent increase. It's other areas we have to look at um, that are going to be causing problems for our tenants. Uh, somebody is uh, fiddling with their microphone. I'm not sure who it is, but if you could desist. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I need a mute button myself sometimes. Right, so anybody else want to speak about this recommendation? In that case, the councillor Wright or Bialik are ready. We will move to the vote. All those in favour? Lord Mayor. All those against? Six, Lord Mayor. Okay, any abstentions? All right, that is clearly carried. Minute 10, Lord Mayor, local tax support scheme 22 23. There is one recommendation which I formally move, Lord Mayor. I second that, Lord Mayor. Okay, anybody you wish? Okay, Councillor Pierce, I gather you want to say something about this a recommendation. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm just going to be really brief on this, but I think it's worth uh, noting for the minutes and anybody who may be watching that this isn't a decision 
uh, that's been easy for the council to come to. I'm really pleased that we have and that we'll continue to find the funding to deliver the council tax support scheme we had this year. It's such an important scheme for some of the most vulnerable and low paid people in our city. The people that have continued to have their pockets picked by the current government as they've slashed 16 billion nationally from council funding, which has caused 10 billion in rises across the nation in council tax to try and mitigate some of that loss so we can continue to deliver the services that these, you know, our residents uh, so desperately need. So I think it's just really, really important to, to note that this is the rise in council tax. We didn't want to do it, we had no choice, and to try and mitigate that to make lives better for some of the people in our city who most need the help. We're, I'm really pleased that this scheme is going to go forward. And thank you. Okay. <laughs> Do I see any other hands? No. Are we happy to proceed to the vote? All those in favour of this recommendation? That's unanimous. Well, that's then. unanimous. Great, that's clearly carried. I remind members that the next three minutes are part two items of business, and if members wish to discuss them, we will have to move into part two. Okay, well, minute 11 and minute 12 are resolved items, uh, Lord Mayor, if anybody's got any questions on it. And then you're quite correct. Yeah. We should move on minute 13. It, it, it will be a part two item if people get into financial detail. Okay. Any questions on minute um, 11 or 12? No, and they are resolved. So minute 13, please, Councillor Bialik. There are, there are four recommendations contained within this one, Lord Mayor, and I formally move them. Thank you. I second them all, but okay. If anybody wishes to debate, then we need to move into part two. I'll see if there's any hands. There is a hand, so we need to move to oh, yeah. again. Lord Mayor, it depends on what the it query depends is. On your question, uh, Councillor Alcock, do you want to ask your question and then we'll decide if we want to move is that into okay part? If, I, if I ask the question and if you decide at that point, I, I'm too new to this to sort of know. You, you, yep. Councillor Alcott, you need to be aware of the information that was the reason it was part yes. two is that it's an exempt information that may well relate to financial affairs of the, yeah. of the yeah. company. If that's the case, then we would need to exclude. If you want to ask a question along those lines, then you would need to ask the council to decide to um, exclude the press and the public. At that point, we would do so. The press and the public would leave, and we would switch off the recording. And then, once that debate has taken place, then we would pass another resolution to get the press and public back into the meeting again. So that's the explanation of it. So it's it's how passionate you feel, if you ask the right word, sorry, about asking the question of a, a nature which may well be a part two. Thank you. I can answer that in, in writing. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Alcock. And I don't see any other hands waving. Um, Councillor so we could move to the vote on the recommendations. All those in favour, please show. Brilliant, that is clearly carried then. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Item 14, <coughs> um, Edwards Court Options Report. There are five recommendations which are formally moved, Lord Mayor. <coughs> Okay, anybody wish to say anything on those which would involve moving into part two? Uh, depending on what it is. Right, no, we will move to the vote then. All those in favour? Unanimous. Unanimous, so that is carried. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Item 15, members training. It's a resolved matter, but questions can be, and again, it could be a part two item depending. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Okay. Any questions? No, that is noted. I beg to move the minutes, Lord Mayor. Second. Passed, moved, yeah. whatever they need to be done. Okay. The executive executive of the eighth of February twenty twenty two, Lord Mayor. Yep. Minute Please. sixteen, minute seventeen, minute eighteen, minute nineteen, Lord Mayor. There are some detailed recommendations which I formally move at this stage. Okay. Is that a second up? Yeah. Anybody wish to say anything about those recommendations? No. In that case, we will move to the vote. All those in favour? Thank you. 
three vote, man. All those against? Aye, Lord Mayor. Any abstentions? Thank you, John. That is clearly carried. Um, we'll move on to minute 20, please, Councillor. Minute 20, minute 20, Lord Mayor, was dealt with in the, in the, in the budget report. Uh, minute 21. Uh, capital strategy 22-23 there is one recommendation which I formally move Lord Mayor anybody wish to say anything uh, Councillor Diana Moore <coughs> thank you just a, a question for clarification I raised at the, um, at the executive the issue of um, the community asset transfer policy is not mentioned under the section relation to stewardship of assets so I'm just clarifying whether the community asset transfer is continuing um, or not. And if it is, I, I believe it should be included in the stewardship of assets section as an appropriate way for council to manage its assets. Would you like to answer that now, Councillor Bialik? Um, well, just to say, uh, from, from what I've heard is that Councillor Moore has already asked that question. I'm assuming she's had an answer. I accept she may not like the answer. That is the answer. I'll take it away and have a look at it to see if it's appropriate that we do that in discussion with the officers. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Sorry, uh, Peter, I raised it against because I didn't have an answer. So I've raised it again. And you've kindly provided answers to other questions that I asked but not to this one. Okay. Uh, did you, well, all I can say, Lord Mayor, is following the last executive, which I, which I believe was this one, I did write to you, asking you to put them in writing to me, and I would answer, if this is one that's fallen through the net, I'll go back and have a look. But I think that's the way we must go in future, because to, to throw a lot of questions at anybody uh, at an executive meeting like that it's very difficult to give you a detailed answer and that is why I'm moving to asking you to, and all the leaders to put them in writing in advance and we will be able to give you a detailed answer that doesn't preclude you from asking on the night but I may not be able to answer it right away and this is the same but I will go away and have a look whether there's a recording I can look at or whatever. I've seen a thumbs up from Councillor Diana Moore. I think she slipped through the net and she will check that it's gone to you and you will reply accordingly. Thank you. So that recommendation then, I believe we can now move to the vote. Minute 21, all those in favour? Five, Thank you. All those against? Any abstentions? Five. Okay, that's really clearly carried. Minute 22, Councillor Bialik. Prudential Code for Capital Finance and Local Authorities, Lord Mayor. There are two recommendations here which I formally move. I second them, Okay, anybody want to ask or say anything? No? Let's move to the vote. All in favour? That's clearly carried, Lord Mayor. Okay. Minute 23, Lord Mayor, Treasury Management Strategy Report 22-23. There's one recommendation here, Lord Mayor, that I formally move. Second, Lord Mayor. Anyone wish to speak? No, let's move to the vote for minute 23. All in favour? Nearly unanimous. A couple of people might be a little distracted, I think. Anyone against? No, that's, that's carried then. Minute um, 24, Lord Mayor, Wanford uh, Health and Wellbeing Centre Feasibility Proposal. There are two recommendations here, Lord Mayor, which I formally move. And I second the Lord Mayor. Anyone want to say anything? Councillor Diana Moore, please. Thank you. At the executive, I asked a question about whether the um, demolition and the construction of the new community hub would assess the carbon impact of doing so. 
I'm, I'm afraid I don't understand the answer, so I'd be grateful if you would clarify. Um, it says that Exeter City Council is committed to achieving net zero, but not prescriptive to this one method and measure, which has the potential for wider consequences at this stage of proceedings. Will you or will you not measure the impact, the carbon impact of demolition and construction? Thank you, Councillor Moore. What I'm going to have to ask you to do is to put that in detail right into me. I can't go, will I, I, won't I, at a meeting like this on something so fundamentally and most importantly as, as that, to be brutally honest. So please, can you write to me? Uh, I know the last reply you had was uh, an officer was away for a while. I was double checking with the officer. That's why you got that answer. And. Um, yeah, if you can write to me, I will get you a reply as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Ward, do you wish to speak? Please go ahead. Yes, Lord Mayor. Um, just, this is a, a, an item that we spoke about uh, during the budget. It's a fantastic project that we're taking forward. has been worked up over many years with the community. It's a fantastic result. I just want to kind of mark that rather than my minor um, questions pouncing between the leader and, and the leader of the uh, opposition there. This is a fantastic project. It is developing a, a community hub. It is a destination and the community will benefit greatly from this project. I just wanted that to be what's remembered from this. Um, Thank you, Councillor Ward. Um, I, this is taking me back slightly to my reception teacher days. We have a couple of naughty boys whispering on the front row. I hope they will desist. <laughs> Do you need to talk? Do you need to ask anything? Yeah, but I, I don't think you can have two conversations going on. It's very distracting. So do we allow private conversations, John? No, no, no. no. It's your discretion. Well, I find it very distracting, and I don't know whether Guy at Council Law or Council Bialik do, but I would prefer that people didn't discuss, because it makes it really hard to concentrate. Thank you, Lord Mayor. You did as well. Well, I think as a chair, I'm asking you not to. Maybe we'll have to have a meeting outside of this about it and see if we can come to some other solution. But it is very distracting, I think, to many people. But if we move on now, um, and you could keep any necessary discussion to an absolute minimum, please. So we are now going to move to the vote for that. Councillor Bialik, if you're happy? Yes. yes okay, all those in favour? Thank you. Any against? Four, Lord Mayor. Any abstentions? That's clearly carried. Uh, minute 26, Lord Mayor, annual pay policy statement, and there are two recommendations here, Lord Mayor, that I formally move. I second the Lord Mayor. 25 is a resolved matter, if anybody wants to ask you any questions, Lord Mayor. Yeah. Oh, there are some questions on minute 25. Um, I will have Councillor Fizzard first, followed by Councillor Pierce, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, current national planning regulations set by central government are often an obstacle to addressing carbon reduction and neutrality targets. Indeed, the Tories abandoned the zero carbon homes policy in 2015, which the last Labour government had introduced. So I welcome this council's work through Exeter City Living and its own council home building programme to disrupt the market with environmental gold standard passive house development. Could the portfolio holder confirm that the new local plan will aim to help support this, count, this council's outstanding approach to net zero targets where national planning policy is so badly failing? Thank you. Do you want to answer that now or do you want to wait? Wait, okay, but let's see what you would like to say, Councillor Pierce. Thanks, uh, Lord Mayor. Uh, it's 
kind of just a little add-on really to what Councillor Bizard said. I think we're obviously on the same sort of page with this already. So um, I'm going to cut out the preamble to my question and just cut to the chase really. So I'm really pleased that we're, we're taking progress um, on a new local plan for our city. And will the council seize the initiative, show the leadership that we're in such need of and consider using all the powers that are available to them under the Planning and Energy Act 2008 to pass regulations for the increase in energy efficiency standards that are needed and not just relying on the outdated and unambitious building regulations we're currently saddled with while the government waits and waits and waits again to bring forward the new national planning policy framework thank you okay anybody else want to add in question no would you like to answer those questions thank you uh thank you both for your question and the short answer to both of them is yes uh, we intend as a local authority to use our local plan to develop a far more environmentally friendly approach to local planning in order to see through our plans to be a carbon neutral city by 2030. We know that successive governments have failed to get a grip on this issue and that the actions of the government, uh, the current government undermined attempts to make residential house building reach higher environmental standards. It is my ambition and the ambition of this Labour Council to see the necessary housing growth provide good quality environmental and sustainable development and reduce the need to build on greenfield sites. Thank you, Councillor Moss. We don't need to vote on that, so we can move on to minute, minute 26. Minute 26, as I said earlier, Lord Mayor, there are two recommendations which are formally moved. Well, I second that. Did anybody wish to say anything about them? No, let's move to the vote. All in favour? Looking unanimous to me. Yep, okay, that's clearly carried. Minute 27, <laughs> Lord Mayor, gender pay gap report. Uh, there <coughs> are two uh, recommendations here which I formally move, Lord Mayor. I second, Lord Mayor. Okay, we can move to the vote. All in favour? Okay, that's clearly carried. Minute 28, Lord Mayor, review of the Council's contaminated land strategy. There is one recommendation here that I formally move. I second it, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Pearce, you'd like to speak? I'm voting. You're voting? <laughs> Please don't vote till I've asked you to. <laughs> this is really taking me back to my year one days now. <laughs> okay, all those, we've all moved to the vote. All those in favour? Okay, that's clearly passed. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, item 29, proposed variation of the public spaces protection order. And here, Lord Mayor, there are four recommendations that I formally move at this stage. Seconded, Lord Mayor. Anyone wish to speak? Uh, Councillor Fole and Councillor then Di Councillor Diana Moore. Councillor Fole first, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, six years ago, PSPO was something of a dirty word. Uh, but times have changed, and our policies, I believe, need to reflect that. Seems to be we're faced with two major problems. Uh, firstly, that uh, in one of the wealthiest nations in the world in 2022, no one should be living on the street. The truth is, however, that there are at least 500 citizens of Exeter who are extremely vulnerable, with up to 50 being street attached. Despite millions of pounds being allocated by central government, as well as local authority funding. Last year, I seen 12 of those living rough die. The life expectation of men living on the street is 45, and for women is 43. Alongside the voluntary and the charitable organisations of our city, we will continue to offer the very best support we can to these vulnerable groups. But there is a second problem. Um, we need to address a small minority of individuals whose antisocial behaviour has and is continuing to have a detrimental effect on the quality of life in our city. We're talking about a group of people that you can count on the fingers of your hands. But several small businesses, businesses have written to the council. Our MP has been contacted by many constituents. And those of us out knocking doors are being questioned as to what we are doing to prevent things like aggressive begging, the setting up of illegal encampments, urinating in doorways, bedding and other effects being left in shop doorways. The measures recommended will address these issues by giving authority to our local police and council employees to deal more effectively with this issue, I believe. 
Thank you, Councillor Fole. Councillor Diana Moore. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction there. Um, I'm very concerned, well, I think it's very interesting that you mentioned about um, 50 people being street attached and also highlighting the need of the vulnerable people who are sleeping rough. I think it's really important that we're, we're clear not to conflate the issue of a culture of sleep detachment and people who are um, homeless and desperate enough that they have to have no choice but to sleep rough. So I have two um, questions for the portfolio holder. Um, can there be monitoring of um, people who um, are issued with an order who, who have who report no fixed abode because I think it's really important that we don't inadvertently impact on people who are homeless and sleeping up. So can <coughs> can no fixed abode be noted and reported, please? And the second issue is in the feedback from the um, consultation on this, which I read um, through because <coughs> most quite a lot of this happens in the city centre and St David's Ward. Um, will there be sufficient resources to enforce this? Uh, well, I'm going to ask John. <laughs> it is a recommendation, so it is a debate, but the council is entitled to ask questions as part of that debate of the portfolio order to respond to be able to make a decision. Okay, so does anybody else wish to speak in any way in this debate? Okay. Just to, to answer oh. Councillor Diana Moore, yep, yep. Um, Go ahead, I think I think you're you're right, and I don't <laughs> care whether it's a, a city councillor or a student at the university or a person who is um, sleeping on the on the street. There are basic things about being aggressive to other people, about urinating in public. The other things that I mentioned that are unacceptable, whoever you are. And the second thing, just to say, is that. Um, the, those orders are to be um, taken forward by the police and not by employees of, of the city council. But there is a liaison officer who is working closely with the police, Adam, I believe is called. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Hannaford, please. Thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. I, I just want to really take this opportunity to support what the portfolio holder has said because um, you know while we all understand people with complex needs and and addictions and the need also to protect them from being exploited from county line gangs and, and one area <coughs> elsewhere that I, we do quite a bit of work on is around the age profile and particularly younger people f uh, people that have come through the care system and failed foster placements and and the concern we've got about the the age profile in extra so many more younger people presenting sleeping rough and how important it is to intervene very quickly so that, that behavior doesn't get entrenched so so i would, I would put a specific theme for that um uh, in particular but i do think there is we do have to strike a balance here and and the reality is um, and I uh, sometimes work late at County Hall and come back through the city centre and, and, and I'm at bus stops with, with people that have done shifts at shops and things. And the city centre can feel like an intimidating place. You know, you know, our, our, there are people in our city that won't come into the city centre at certain times because they don't feel safe. And that goes against everything that the city council is trying to work towards and achieve in terms of economic activity and, and, and social activities. So we must strike a right balance on that we must get some element of control there not only to protect the vulnerable people but to make sure that we that we uh, you know, protect uh, and and make people make sure that people feel safe in the city center it's essential and i commend the portfolio holder uh, for trying to get that difficult balance but no, no less striking that right balance because we must make sure that everybody feels safe in the city whoever they are Do you wish to speak, Councillor Wright? Or do we go straight to Councillor Bialik to sum up? You're happy to go to the vote. Okay, all those in favour of this recommendation. Okay, maybe unanimous. Anybody against? Any abstentions? Okay, that's clearly carried. Minute 30, Lord Mayor, authorisation of legal services officers to attend the magistrates and county courts 
and changes to the scheme of delegation for legal services, there is one recommendation that I formally move, Lord Mayor. I second it, Lord Mayor. Anybody wish to speak? No, let's move to the vote. All those in favour? Anyone against? Any abstentions? I think, oh, sorry, I know you said unanimous. I got a bit distracted there. Um, all right, we must be nearing the end of it, I Minute think. 31, Lord Mayor, Exeter City Living Business Plan. This is a resolved matter, Lord Mayor. Any questions on that? Anybody? Minute no? 32, Lord Mayor, business case for the creation of residential property company. Uh, resolved minute, Lord Mayor. Any questions? No? I beg to move the minutes, Lord Mayor. Right, I think we've uh, got through them. Brilliant. So, unfortunately, no, I didn't mean unfortunately, there are some other things on the agenda for tonight. Uh, the next one is item nine on the agenda, which relates to a change in committee membership to report, which is as follows. It's about the Exeter Harbour Board. To note that Simon Adams has been put forward as a member of the Exeter Harbour Board, taking the place of Paul Labistor, who sadly passed away last year. Thank you, members. That brings us to item 10 on the agenda. And I can confirm that a notice of motion has been received from Council of Wardle in accordance with Standing Order 6, the details of which are set out on your agenda papers. Councillor Wardle, do you wish to read out the notice of motion? Or can uh, people just read it themselves? Yeah, people are ready. Yeah, I think Thank everybody... You. I think it will be evident from the uh, agenda. Yeah. Uh, okay. Mayor. So, would you like to speak to the motion? Oh, yes, please, if I might. Need a second, I'll, I'll, please. Martin Pierce, thank you. I know it's getting rather late, Lord Mayor, but I just mentioned that a member of the public is with us who's had the stamina to stay behind to hear the debate on this subject. Deserve congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd leave the first meeting. <laughs> right, well, <clears throat> can I firstly say in relation to this motion, Lord Mayor, that uh, the motion has got several elements, but I don't believe that this council has the clout or anything to do with the recent decision of South Western Rail to restore the hourly service from Exeter to Waterloo by Salisbury from yesterday. <laughs> so, uh, of the other items here, the relation to stagecoach buses, as far as I know, the reduced service continues. However, I understand the bus funding may be cut across the country by one third in a matter of weeks and it's unknown what, if any help uh, or money, bus companies will get from the government as part of their levelling up white paper on bus service improvement plans, BSRPs, which are the, the funding for which is apparently due to be announced by the end of this, this month, that's a few days time. However, in relation to buses, the day-to-day -day experience of buses in Exeter, from what uh, people, members of the public and others tell me, is that they're unreliable and expensive, and because of this, some people now use their cars, which isn't something we want. They ask the question, can't we have a bus service that is not a profit-making machine, but one that is a social service? Maybe like Reading Council, who never sold their buses back in the 80s and who continue to run their own bus services, which are very highly regarded as an example to other areas. Or maybe like Nottingham, who fund buses and trams from workplace parking levies. The other uh, point of the motion is an appeal for something to be done about what I call the elephant in the room which is the number of cars moving in and out of the city on a daily basis, causing congestion and emissions which must surely run counter to our carbon reduction and healthy living policies. And the figures on that, according to some recent research based on the 2011 census, are of the 36,500 commuters into the city, 
84% do so by car, and of the 10,200 who commute out of the city, 78% do that by car. Now, though the government has decided to stop the pandemic-related restrictions from tomorrow, and they want people to return to their normal workplaces, we don't actually know how that's going to work out in terms of people travelling within and in and out of the city compared to the situation of two years ago. But the other factor that looms on the horizon, which cannot be ignored, of course, is the planned growth in housing within and outside the city. In the now shelved Greater Exodus Strategic Plan 2020, the housing plans were for 53,260 houses by 2040, spread across a possible 38 sites. Whatever's happened to that plan, and it's because the other, a number of the other districts sort of effectively scuppered it in the name of retaining independence over this matter. In addition, what we do seem to know is that there are plans to build, for example, a second new town east of Cranbrook, a likely new town in the Cullens and Tilton Parkway area, and as yet unknown plans in the other three district council areas. And of course, these homes aren't generally going to have one person in them. So the population will increase, uh, and those people will want and need to move about by some means or other, all add into the total numbers of people needing transport. Fortunately, the results of the 2021 census are due to be published in May this year. And although I think it's fair to say that Exeter City Council probably does not have the staff or the money to undertake the research on the results of the 2021 census, and uh, extrapolate the figures of uh, who's going to be moved by what form of transport up to 230, 240, 250, take it what you will, it's likely that the Exeter City Futures, in collaboration with, for example, the University, probably will have the staff and the money to examine these 2021 sensor figures and the projections that we can uh, base, uh, that, that can be based uh, from then on. And then these figures can then be considered by the City Council Transport Working Group who can work with the current Transport Authority which is Devon County Council. So this motion asks for all these matters to be examined and radical plans to be drawn up uh, relating to travelling matters within and around the city. So for that reason I'm asking you to support the motion. Thank you. Okay, I see Councillor Harvey, um, and I see Councillor Sparling, anybody else? Okay, we'll start with you please, Councillor Harvey. Um, I, I applaud this motion, um, but sadly I have further bad news to add to that which Councillor Wardle has heaped upon us. Um, it is certain that the government will draw the 30% pandemic funding which they currently give to bus companies um, by the end of April. Devon County Council, we were advised by Mike Watson at the last, uh, sorry, who is the MD of Stagecoach South West, that Devon County Council are planning to reduce the concessionary fares reimbursement um, to bus companies due to the lack of take-up by people with bus passes, although I know that many people in this room are not qualified to have such a such a thing. So the income to bus companies is going to reduce, and that can only lead to further reductions in services. Railway companies are also experiencing a huge downturn in demand, particularly commuter demand. Leisure traffic is holding up, but that's from a very low base. So the situation regarding the public transport is pretty grim at the moment. The City Council, as Councillor Wardle has alluded to, is not the highway authority and has no responsibility, legal responsibility, but we will do all we can through the Transport Working Group to press the highway authority to support public transport as much as they possibly can. It is interesting to note the planning issues 
in my ward, Pinhoe, and to the east of Exeter, a document called the Pinhoe Access Strategy, and then a further version of it called the Pinhoe Amended Access Strategy, refers in great number, this is a highway document produced by the County Council, refers in great number to the transport requirements of development being mitigated by bus services. Several of us pointed out that bus services weren't guaranteed. Houses would be once they were built. You can't take them away from people, but the bus services wouldn't be guaranteed. Fortun unfortunately, what many of us predicted will come to pass and that those houses have been built and those buses will not run. Thus adding, as Councillor Wardler has explained, further misery to those of us um, in, in the city regarding congestion. As the chair of the City Council Transport Working Group, I can assure Councillor Wardle that these matters will be taken very seriously by that group and investigated by that group. But as it stands at the moment, I am not um, optimistic about the outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Councillor Spalding, please. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, and uh, thank you to Councillor Wardle for bringing this motion before Council. Um, since the Transport Working Group uh, seemed to have stalled last year, it's great we're finally getting some momentum on it. Uh, the group's first meeting last Wednesday enjoyed an interesting discussion, and I'd like to take this opportunity to also thank Councillor Spall, Councillor Harvey, and the officers involved in getting the group up and running. Um, I hope Councillor Wardle agrees the items were well covered in the discussion of future work for the group and that we appear to have a good consensus of work to focus on. Um, and whilst the motion is largely positive, um, please can it be confirmed that this would not take precedence over other items from the meeting, such as the safety of women and vulnerable groups getting around the city, especially at night. Thank you. Would you like who are you addressing that question to, or yeah. is, it a, is it to be summed up by the leader, or would you like to, Tony to confirm that, or David? I'm David. Yeah, yeah. I'll do that. Um, again, as has been outlined on many occasions this evening by the leader, um, bringing questions to a meeting without prior warning create a great deal of difficulty. However, I can, assure, from the I, I, I can assure. Can we just listen to David? And then I can assure Councillor Spaulding that those matters that were raised as matters of urgency at the Transport Working Group last week will be dealt with as a matter of urgency. As if this meeting recommends to um, move this motion to the Transport Working Group to look at, they will all be given considerable attention to detail and to the uh, and to the thoughts behind them. Yes, Councillor Spaulding, we will deal with all of these as a matter of priority. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. So it's point of order. Yes, Councillor Diana Moore. Can you say what your point of order is, please, Councillor Moore? Uh, yes, clarification as part of the debate. That's that questions. Point of clarification then, rather than point uh, of order. Well, I think it's perfectly appropriate that a question is raised as part of the debate in order to know whether somebody is able to vote on it or not. So I just wanted to make that point. As I did earlier, Councillor Moore. Okay, so the question has been asked, which is acceptable, and it has been answered. Councillor Bialik. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, if this helps Councillor Sparling, we take very seriously the safety of women at the night time, and there is no way I want to see that question devalued in when we take things forward. Turning to the motion itself, and um, I'm quite pleased to uh, see it talks about the old Exeter City Transport um, department which sadly went away in, in 1970 that was as a consequence of the road um, traffic uh, sorry the transport act of 1968 uh, which sort of brought a lot of the uh, private bus companies under the auspices of the national bus company and uh, this was a municipal company which um, around about 1970 sold out because whatever the reasons was it was then transferred into the national bus company now do you know this could be a perfect store in relation to uh, when tony talks about the buying of a bus company i suppose as a trade union official and an ex-bus driver i'd always wanted to own my own bus company 
because I, I always thought I could do it better than they could. However, there is a lot to it. Resources is a main issue, but the perfect storm I'm talking about is actually uh, buying stuff as a knockdown price. So, I've always had an issue with private profit with public subsidy. And that's exactly what has happened to the bus industry since 1985 on the 26th of October when the buses were deregulated. I've done away with the traffic commissioners. I'm sorry, this is a, a sort of a, a, a pet subject of mine and I understand it. So what I'm trying to say is there's a lot to it. A lot can be achieved. I'm happy uh, to, to support the notice of motion and to have these issues debated in that forum. But I, all I would temper it a bit, as uh, Councillor Harvey said, temper it against, because I can see the um, <laughs> the chief executive thinking, oh my God, what is he now going to give me to have to do? And we have to be mindful of the resources on what we're trying to do. We've got some key priorities as a city, right, that we need to bring forward. We will be in discussions with the bus company um, and no stagecoach would like to bring forward uh, electric buses into Exeter. The bid wasn't successful last time. Our challenge is with the county to make sure they bring that bid, so we want to do it. There's the issue of hydrogen to make the streets cleaner. I'd love to see a tram. Whether that will happen in Exeter, I don't know. So we need to think about this. I'm happy for it to go forward, happy for it to take a number of issues forward but we just need to temper it and certainly we don't want to knock other priorities that we want to do off the agenda. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Okay. If no one else wishes to... Yeah, Councillor Pearce has got an opportunity to come back as a second. Oh, of course you have, Councillor Pearce. Yeah, thanks, Lord Mayor. So, uh, just to sum up really, second this motion, you know, we've got a government that professes to love public transport, a Prime Minister who makes models, he adorns them with his um, slogans when he's campaigning, and then he tells us he's going to bust back better and promises three billion of funding to make our services, and I quote directly, more frequent, cheaper, greener and easier to use. All aspirations that I'm sure everyone in this room tonight would support, I know I do. The journey starts so well from there, and then we find ourselves in the dark and the rain, stood at an uncovered bus stop with no service in sight. The promised funding from only a year ago has now been cut by more than half, and as a result many regions will be left with nothing. From this current government, there is no drive to actually see these promises through. It's once again left to local authorities to try and deliver what our residents were promised by others. In Exeter, we will continue to do this, not just because it is the right thing to do, but because it has the backing of an overwhelming number of our residents. And that support has been demonstrated over a long period of time. From the thousands that responded to the Air Quality Action Plan consultations prior to its adoption as Council Policy in 2018, to the hundreds that joined the Exeter Area Bus Action Group on Facebook in just a few hours last week, and so many others. They all support measures to improve the way people travel and move around our city. And as we continue to emerge from surviving the pandemic towards once again being the thriving city that drives our region's economy, this must be one of our focuses. It was fantastic to see that the Transport Working Group was convened recently, and I hope this was the first step on a path to making the improvements to the way we move people um, around this city and make the adjustments people are so desperate to see. The people of Exeter support the measures highlighted by Councillor Wardle in this motion, be that reducing access to certain parts of our city by private vehicles, those that do not meet agreed standards, businesses paying a fee for the provision of private car parking, following the example of the taxi industry and transitioning to electric vehicles to help reduce emissions. When options like those outlined in the motion were considered before, decisions were made that were deemed correct for the city at that time. And the world has moved on in the last few years. And it's only right that we refocus attention and investigate all these options again. And I commend this motion to you and urge you all to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor P.S. Anybody else wishing to speak? <coughs> Would you like to sum up, Councillor Wardle? Uh, well, I just wel <coughs> welcome the supportive comments that have been made and the extra information. I just say that this is a sense quite rightly that uh, the thing is uh, moving towards the shambles because you're having more houses and less decent transport and relying more and more on the car <coughs> in practice increasing carbon emissions and so on run completely counter to what we're trying to do. So 
some something needs to be done, you know, about it. Um, I welcome the support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Wardle. All in favour? That is unanimously carried. Thank you very much, everybody. That brings us to agenda item 11 on the agenda, which relates to questions from members in accordance with Standard Order 8. A can confirm that the question has been received from Councillor Diana Moore. I believe you've been emailed a copy of this question. Thank you, Lego and Pauline. Have a nice evening. Can I remind all councillors that this question and answer will be given without debate? Any question at present is entitled to a supplementary question. Again, it should be put and answered without debate. Councillor Moore, can you please ask a question? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Exeter City Council is a member organisation of Exeter City Futures. Who will be appointed on behalf of the Council to the Exeter City Futures Board now that the Council's nominated board member has been seconded to lead Exeter City Futures? Councillor Gellert, do you wish to answer the question? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, thanks for the question. The matter of the Council's appointment to Exeter City Futures has been a matter I have been given consideration to. I fully intend to have the Council fully represented and like many other decisions on the council appointments to boards, will be determined by council following the upcoming local elections. Do you have a supplementary? I do. I had a discussion with um, my colleague, co leader, and other leader um, in relation to best um, practice. And the council giving consideration to setting up a shareholder advisory committee to oversee the work of the council's representative the council's representatives on its own and other significant companies. I'm not asking you for yes no, I'm just asking you could you give me a discussion about that. Well, Lord Mayor, I won't give a yes or no because I didn't mention anything about that in my response and the supplementary should be based upon that. Councillor Moore, please email me on that and I'll give it serious consideration. I want to look at the governance. I want to make sure we represent it correctly. And that is what my response was. And I will do that. And I will do it <coughs> following, or we will do, the council will do it following the main elections. OK, thank you. Members, that now brings us to the end of the evening's meetings of council. And I now formally close.